So I'd like to uh, welcome Noah Siegel to the Circular Community Exploration Circle today. And I'm, I'm just gonna turn it over to Noah. Hello everybody, my name's Noah. I am a passionate food grower. Um, I've been growing food um, for roughly five-ish years. Um, the journey I took to growing started when I went on a trip to Thailand where I saw the impact that food could have um, on people and specifically permaculture. So we, uh, in, in Thailand, I did a permaculture plot for a school um, that didn't have access to a lot of fresh produce. So after we did that plot and we saw that, you know, these children could get fresh produce every day, it was such an eye-opening experience for me. And it was so beautiful. And the connection to the earth that I found during th that project was also very profound and opened my eyes to, to the importance of connecting to nature and growing food. So today I'm going to give an introduction to ROA, which is regenerative organic agriculture, which is a relatively new term in the field of agriculture. Everyone is familiar with organic, um, but this kind of goes above and beyond organic in many ways. And I'll be kind of explaining the differences between the two and also the differences between um, ROA and conventional agriculture. Um, so first, what is it? So ROA, regenerative organic agriculture, is a farming ideology that rehabilitates soil life and ecosystems through a lot of different farming techniques that I'll discuss in the presentation. One of the main purposes of ROA is to sequester CO2 into the soil, meaning take carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and bring it into the soil to, to hold. And also, very importantly, is to create um, a lot of biomass, and also, most importantly, to create a regenerative food source. Um, there's a lot of components of ROA. There's like the cultivation, um, growing the food. There's also the ethics behind ROA. There's the social aspects behind ROA. There's a lot of social, social fairness, um, fair pay, um, things like that that are also associated with ROA. Um, first, I'd like to talk about regenerative versus sustainable, because I get this question a lot. A sustainable practice means that this thing will sustain itself every single year. Like organic agriculture, how it works is you get basically the same yield every single year, and you're using the same amount of nutrients in the soil every single year. And it's hard to expand past that with, with the basic organic um, practices. Regenerative means that not only are you taking soil that's been degraded from conventional use for hundreds of years of, of abuse, you're generating that soil, but you're also, every single year, you're actually getting higher and higher yields and um, abundance. So first I'd like to talk about the difference between the two. There's conventional, which is the majority of the practice that is used in the world is conventional agriculture. And the methods they follow in conventional agriculture um, follow tilling. They use monocrop fields, meaning it's growing one crop like corn, soy, wheat. They utilize pesticides fertilizers, and herbicides, things like that. And there's a lot of bare soil, meaning during their off season, there isn't anything growing. The soil is completely bare. You probably notice driving in a, in a rural area um, that farmland can either be fully covered or completely bare. And they also use heavy machinery like big tractors or combines and things like that. Some of the practices that regenerative uses, this is, doesn't include the full um, exhaustive list, but these are the majority of them. We follow no-till management 
polyculture, meaning growing multiple different plant species at once, utilizing compost and composting methods, cover cropping, crop rotation, utilization of agroforestry and permaculture, and combination of mushroom cultivation. So here's an example of a conventionally grown farm. Um, what you can see here is one crop, I believe this is potatoes, grown down um, tight rows with a big tractor coming down the middle of it, spraying some sort of fertilizer or pesticide or herbicide, something like that. Not really any trees in sight. Um, pretty interesting. Uh, here's a, another example. This is an example of a regenerative farm. This is actually the land uh, I am a steward of in Pompano Beach, Florida. And you can see a couple of things are different. One, you see trees that are bordering um, the farm. Another thing is you see that there's weeds. <laughs> so a, a really good sign uh, is, is of a good farm is that there's weeds. Um, a lot of people think that weeds are bad. Weeds are a name that we gave a plant. There's no bad plant. Um, so you can also see someone out in the field weeding uh, by hand, <laughs> which is also uh, not really practiced a lot in the US. And you can also see, this is kind of early on in the season, but you can see a multitude of different crops being grown. Um, not just one crop, and there's not a, a huge tractor uh, going down the field. So I'm going to give a little history about conventional agriculture. I usually don't like to use the words good or bad uh, in general about anything. And I don't want to ever um, tell someone what they're doing is bad. Uh, so I'm just going to give a little bit of history about how conventional agriculture kind of got to the place it is now. Um, it happened, it started during the industrial revolution, really, where there was advances in technology um, for cropping systems. But the main spike occurred during World War I and World War II, when there was a, a mass panic um, in Americans' minds about the war and about everything that was going on at the time. This caused um, the government to um, basically require farms at that time to grow big, grow big or get out was the, um, the motto used. Um, so it, ca it caused small farms to either grow big and get really big, bigger than what they're used to getting, or small farms to not want to grow big or to just get out and, put, and stop farming, which caused a mass decrease in the amount of people that were farming. Um, before, prior to World War II um, and the Industrial Revolution, there was 50 to 70 percent um, people were, were farming and growing their own food. And after that, just a steep decline. Now, less than 2 percent of our world's population grows all of our food, um, which is a uh, a crazy number because usually the number that gets people to start being worried is when it's below 49%, but we're less than 2%. So there's not a lot of farmers uh, right now in the world. Um, so with, with an another advancement that came during World War II was um, glyphosate was used to clean out um, the barrels of a tank. And they noticed that, the, that the, when the glyphosate would come out of the tank, it would kill the grass underneath the barrel of the tank. So they were like, well, this, this, is, this could be used as an herbicide to kill weeds. So what they did was they took the petunia plant and they got a cell of the petunia plant, which was naturally resistant to glyphosate, AKA Roundup. And merged it with a soybean genetically and made the first Roundup Ready crop seed, um, Roundup Ready soy, 
Roundup ready meaning that this plant can be planted and grown and be sprayed with Roundup, but the plant will live. So this made it a lot easier for farmers to just be able to plant massive rows of um, corn, soy, and wheat and manage them just by spraying Roundup all over their, or over their um, crops. Um, unfortunately, glyphosate um, isn't the, the best chemical. Um, it has been shown to cause non lymphoma type of cancer, um, and it is everywhere um, right now in the world. Um, 39 out of 40 um, beer, beer and wines were tested and all contained glyphosate. And then uh, there was a test done um, with, the, with, with food, even takeout food, um, ordering takeout, and the majority of those foods contain glyphosate in them as well. So we have a big problem with, with glyphosate. We, we use um, more than 250 million pounds of glyphosate on our crops each year. Now, because these Roundup Ready crops are, are so dominant, um, they make up the majority of what we grow in the world, not just the US. Um, I don't know if you've been reading through this slide, um, but 90 percent of, of the corn, wheat, and soy grown in the U.S. are Roundup Ready. Um, it's, actually, it's actually higher than that now. So there's a very few percentage of crops um, of corn, wheat, and soy in the U.S. that are not Roundup Ready or sprayed with Roundup, meaning like natural native corn varieties. And Another interesting thing is that the Roundup Ready seed itself is actually a pesticide, meaning that you can't handle it with your hands. You have to use gloves when touching the seed itself, um, which is another alarming thing for me to think about. Um, yeah, so with, with Roundup Ready corn, wheat and, wheat and soy, it's also those three crops are subsidized meaning that the government incentivizes you to grow them because if the price of one of those commodities fluctuates, you still get the same amount of money. So there's, there's a, lot of, um, a lot of governmental things with, with agriculture today. Another thing is le less than 7% of farmers uh, in the world grow more than four different crops. So when, so these farmers normally, when they're growing one thing, when they're growing something, they're usually growing one thing. They're usually growing either corn, wheat, or soy. One is because they're used in so many things. They're subsidized. They're so easy to grow, um, but they come with a lot of problems. Um, the conventional way of growing depletes our soil in many ways. Um, and I'll touch on that uh, more in a minute. But when you spray fertilizers and um, Roundup and herbicides and pesticides and things like that on your crop, it's not like that it just goes on the crop. It goes everywhere. Um, because the soil that conventional agriculture um, growers have been growing on is so depleted um, there's nothing in the soil for for this fertilizer to hold on to um, so it just runs off um, a lot into the water a lot into our wells and aquifers and things like that um, and also uh, I mean I've I've seen this firsthand I was a captain and a boat captain for an ocean cleanup company. And I saw one day that the water turned lime green um, with a huge algal bloom. And now it's because Florida Sugar that's up in central Florida has a deal 
with the government that allows them to dump anything they want into the waterway. And these algal blooms caused by fertilizer, nitrogen fertilizers mostly, um, cause red tide, um, which then causes a process called eutrophication, which causes a depletion of, of oxygen in the, in the water, which kills a lot of fish and kills a lot of plants and my, uh, micro um, bacteria in the water as well. And the oceans are incredibly important because they provide a lot of our, our breathable oxygen. A lot of people don't know that, but our oceans are incredibly important for providing us with air to breathe. Um, another, another problem with conventional agriculture is because they're just growing these foods, these foods, um, that we don't really eat um, a lot of these foods that are grown. Like, for example, corn is grown. Um, we, we eat about less than 3% of the actual corn that's grown, the percentage of corn that's grown. The majority of it gets turned into ethanol or um, fed to cattle, things like that. Um, and corn also, on, on the top of, of corn, um, doesn't really have innately a lot of nutrients in it itself. One of the arguments that conventional agriculturalists use um, is that they can grow 13 billion acres, 13 billion food calories per acre, meaning that an acre of corn, you can get 13 billion calories from it. Um, but actually, the corn itself does not have a lot of um, nutrition. Um, actually, basically none at all, none at all. The natives, the way that they would treat corn, would, they would actually ferment the corn in lime to produce niacin, which is an, a, an essential B vitamin. And it would also allow them to digest it better. We don't uh, usually practice that. Um, and um, a lot of these corn, wheat, and soy, you see them in a lot of our products that we buy, a lot of our processed products. Um, I also want to touch on a topic called hidden hunger, um, which is basically, uh, if you read the bottom, I'll just read the bottom paragraph for you. More than half of the world today suffer, suffers from hidden hunger, a condition defined by a deficiency of micronutrients despite adequate daily caloric intake. So this is due to having a bunch of processed foods that are cheap, like McDonald's and chips and things like that, that have high calories, but don't have nutrition. So there's a difference between the two. Um, and it's not, it's not really the calories that we're wanting to for our health. It's all the, it's all the nutrients and vitamins and minerals that um, make our body function the way they're supposed to. Um, and unfortunately, the, the, the population that suffers the most from this hidden hunger is our low-income families or our homeless um, that don't have access to buying these um, organic produce that we have in stores or cold foods and things like that. So it's these low-income families that, that suffer the most because it's a lot cheaper just to go to McDonald's and get a meal for their family than it is to go to Whole Foods and buy a bunch of veggies and cook them up. Um, unfortunately, that's the, the case right now. So um, I'll show you a graph. Here's a graph of that shows you um, food minerals present in crops uh, from 1925 to to now, and and you can see that over time um, we've just been losing the amount of nutrients in our food. These, these nutrients here, phosphorus, selenium, copper, magnesium, cobalt, calcium, zinc, iron, are incredibly important to the function of our body. And we lack that. Um, and you, you can also taste the lack of it. When you go to the store, I don't know if any of you have ever grown your own tomato, but when you go to the store and you buy a tomato versus when you grow a tomato at home and you eat it, 
it tastes completely different. The one you grow at home tastes so good. And it's not just because you put so much love into it and you're like so happy that you have this plant um, and you spent days watering it that you're just like, oh, this, this tastes better. No, it tastes better because it has things in it. It's not just water. It's not just a sack of, of, of water. So um, this, this de decline is, is a little concerning, um, but that's where ROA um, comes into place. So why does regenerative agriculture work? So it works because our main ideology is using nature as our greatest teacher, observing nature and simulating and doing exactly what nature does so that we have the best, best results. And I'll, I'll, I'll touch on this a lot because this is one of my key philosophies. But when you look at a forest, if you go walk into a forest, you're not looking at this tree that's sitting there and saying, this tree looks like it needs water or this tree looks like it needs fertilizer or this tree looks like it needs Roundup. No, you're not because the tree is doing beautifully. It's surrounded by all of its friends and it has everything it needs. It gets, it gets rain, it gets compost, it gets fertilizer, it gets everything it needs. And all the plants around it gets everything it needs from the tree and they all work together and it's a beautiful system. Every single aspect of, of a forest is a perfect way to, to structure a farm. Um, the second is love, which is incredibly important in everything you do, but also important um, in farming. Because if you're loving what you're doing, you're putting that energy into the food and the food has that energy in it and you're giving it and sharing it with every, everyone. Having awareness, awareness of what you're doing um, at all times is important. Because um, we, sometimes we get into rhythms where we do things and we're not really aware of what we're doing. And you can be doing something on a farm that we've been doing our whole lives, but um, would not be as beneficial. Being in tune with oh, many things, with the seasons, um, the day-to-day -day weather, climate, the moon. Um, the moon actually plays a huge part in growing food. And of course, just having trust, trust that mother nature will do everything uh, it needs to do because it always does. So the first um, staple of ROA is carbon sequestration. And that is um, maximizing atmospheric carbon dioxide removal and minimizing so soil carbon losses. There's a lot of things that act, that minimize our, our or that actually take carbon out of our soil. One of them being being tilling. Um, there's there's um, for soil carbon sequestration to occur, all the soil organic carbon sequestered must originate from the atmospheric carbon pool and be transferred into the soil organic matter through plants, um, plant residues, microbial residues, and other organic solids. Soil organic matter, while highly variable, is com comprised of about 50% soil organic carbon. Um, so one of the main ways we get high carbon sequestration is through growing lots of plants, because I'll, I'll explain how that works um, in the next slide, but also having biodiversity of plants, and not just of plants, but in soil life, animal life, insect life. They all work together, together to, to provide um, and bring CO2 into the ground. So here's a little graphic. Um, this is given by the Rodale Institute. And the Rodale Institute, if, if you're unaware of, is a very, very important nonprofit organization in the US that has actually been studying regenerative organic agriculture since the 70s. Um, they've they coined the term and they've been doing massive research on the effects of our way. Um, one of the things they do is they actually take conventional farms and they help them transition to our way. Um, but they've also they have massive research studies. One of their most important studies is their carbon sequestration study. So this is diagram shows that 
due, due to photosynthesis, the plant uses CO2 and turns it into a sugar carbohydrate. And then the bottom here, this is the bottom of a plant underground where the roots are, it's called a rhizosphere. There's, called, there's something called plant exudates. From the root tips of a plant, a plant will extrude a mixture of carbohydrates, lipids, and things like that to the microbes that live in the ground, um, fungal microbes and bacteria. The bacteria and, and fungus will then take the, this exudate and consume it and in return, give the plant exactly what it needs. So this, this uh, interaction alone, I could talk for hours on, it's, it's one of the coolest things ever. Basically the plant um, is, is giving this, these microbes, which I call the little chefs, all the ingredients it needs to make this plant a cake for its birthday. So the exudates come with all these ingredients, the microbes take it and make nitrogen and phosphorus and give it back to the plant and also give it to a, the plant in a plant absorbable form, which is also incredibly important. Um, but also when they have this, this carbohydrate that was CO2 um, and they die, it stays in the soil. So that's, that's one of the, the branches of how carbon sequestration works through photosynthesis, having plants to take the carbon, give it to the, to the microbes, the microbes give back to the plant, the microbes die, called necromass, and they're now part of the soil minerals. Um, next, we're gonna talk about no-till. So tilling is a, is a pretty um, big thing. It's still very, very, very large. Um, in organic agriculture, you till, people till. Um, it's a very hard thing to tell people that it's possible not to till um, because we've been doing it for so long and um, it's just a practice that's been going on forever. But there's actually a way where we don't have to till. Um, and the, the reason why, well, tilling, let me, let me talk about tilling first. Tilling is basically overturning, disturbing, um, and digging up soil in order to prepare seed beds for farming. Um, and I'll give a diagram in the next slide, but what tilling does is it actually de destroys this soil food web that's present under the ground. Um, the, the simple solution presented by nature is na nature doesn't have to have a, a guy on a tractor coming through and tilling a forest um, every year to prepare the, seed, the ground for seeds to go into. The, the, the forest does it in a perfect way. The trees drop leaf litter on the ground, which then bugs and other organic other organisms eat turn into organic matter, which adds a fresh layer of compost on top of the surface of the forest floor. If you ever like walk into the soil the, into a forest and just like grabbed a handful of, of soil and just like looked at it, it's it's always just so rich and black, full of little worms and full of organisms and so beautiful and it smells so good. That's and it doesn't have to have a tiller, it does it by itself, it's perfect. Um, so here's, here, here's a diagram of the soil food web. Now, a lot of people don't really know that like, there's a, there's a food web up on land of creatures, but also below the surface in the soil, are generally around the rhizosphere, which again is this area around the plants, roots. There's the whole soil food web happening. There's, there's animals eating other animals and things like that. Um, bacteria get eaten by protozoa um, and fungi, nematodes, arthropods. And all of these are vital for the function of a, of a healthy soil. Um, for example, I, ha I did a soil test um, on, the, on the land that I'm on now and 
um, it, sh it showed me that I had low predators, which seems like it would be a good thing. Normal people would look and be like, oh, I don't have any predators. That's good. But actually, you want, every you want everything to be balanced. You want to have predators. If you, you don't have predators, you have too much of one thing and everything gets in balance. So there are some things I'm doing to increase the predator count in my soil, planting certain plants that attract beneficial insects, things like that. So the soil food web is incredibly, incredibly important to the function of, of, of everything, specifically to the function of a plant. Now, what conventional agriculture does is they don't have a soil food web. There's nothing, there's none of these creatures in their soil, generally. There's just dirt um, and the plant. And what they do is they just feed the plant a chemical nitrogen or phosphorus or potassium um, into the plants themselves through the roots. Um, and this doesn't really give um, the plant all of its nutrients it needs because NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, isn't uh, everything a plant needs. There's 13 main um, uh, chemicals that are needed for a plant's function, um, but there's a lot more than 13 that, that make up everything. Um, so, but with, with the advent of all of these um, creatures in our soil, we have everything we need. Um, if, you have, if you've been using ROA for years, um, there are times where I, I, I don't need to do anything at all, not even add any manure or any compost because once you have a good system, the, the plant, these creatures and the plant and everything works together to actually get all the nutrients it needs. Again, a forest doesn't need fertilizer. It does everything itself perfectly. The polyculture is, is a huge one. Um, this means just growing more than one thing. Um, like I said, a lot of conventional farms use monocropping, meaning growing one crop at a time. ROA heavily uses polyculture. Um, and, not, and, and this isn't just polyculture in our veggies, but also in, in our beneficial plants, um, in our trees, flowers, things like that. Um, polyculture has a lot of benefits. It um, suppresses pests. Um, this is, this is a simple idea, um, a vector suppression um, technique. When, if there's a field of corn and a disease comes and attacks the corn, it all gets decimated. But if there's a field of corn that's layered behind five or six different fields of other veggies, and this disease has uh, barriers that prevent it from getting to corn. So this is, this is how it suppresses um, pests, suppresses weeds again, because of the biodiversity and the coverage that these plants have it, and um, disease, same with the pests, works the same way. Um, here's a little snippet of a polycultural row. Um, you can see many different things growing here. Sorry, it's not the highest quality of, of photo. Um, next, composting, another incredibly important part of ROA. If you wanna practice no-tilling methods, you have to have organic matter applied to your soil uh, almost every year. I, I personally add two to three inches of compost to all my um, rows every single, before every single season. Um, composting is a big word. I'm sure all of you know of composting. Maybe some of you have even uh, tried composting. Um, and there's a lot of uh, stigma behind it as well. Um, but composting can be very simple and composting is just the conversion of plant matter, um, into a useful soil amendment and compost, a good compost has everything in it. It has everything, uh, that the soil needs in it. The, um, it's, it's, it's good for our world because we have a lot of organic waste, um, Sadly, 40% of the produce that we grow is thrown away. 
Um, and that could be turned into usable compost that could be beautiful for our, our, our gardens or our farms. Um, composting is generally a mixture of greens and browns. And there's a temperature um, aspect to it. If you're using, if you're using um, browns that have uh, weeds and weed seeds in it, you want to make sure that the temperature of your compost gets to a certain level in order to kill the weed seeds, or you'll just have a row full of weeds. Um, there's three different uh, phases that generally compost goes through. It's a mesophilic, which is like 90 degrees, um, where all of these um, larger um, bacteria and, and fungi come and break down the sugars and things from our matter. Um, after the sugars are released, there's a thermophilic process where compost can get uh, 120 to 160-ish. Uh, I've seen it go higher than that. I've seen compost catch, catch on fire before, uh, so it can get really hot. And during that process, all the uh, weed seeds um, get killed. And also the, um, the smaller, more resistant um, bacteria and fungal networks come in and take the compost into a different state. And then after that, there's another rest of, um, mesophilic resting period. Um, there's a lot of methods of composting. Um, there's a tumbler method, which maybe you've seen these, these big barrels that you can load um, organic matter into and they tumble and you can turn them that way. There's heaps. It's a very simple form. Um, you basically make a lasagna of greens and browns. Um, there's a three bin pallet system, which is another very simple method. We have three different bins. The first one's green, the second one's browns, and the third one's finished compost. You have vermicomposting, which is the addition of using um, earthworms because earthworms compost. Um, so you're using their unique skill to help you. Um, and then you have one of my favorites, um, which is called the Johnson Sioux Bioreactor. Johnson Sioux is the name of two people um, from the University of California that developed a bioreactor. And I think I have a picture of that. So here's the, here's the, the pallet. You can use pallets. This person made it a really fancy one with chicken wire. Um, but you can see there's a mixture and they mix it together and they have um, compost, tumbler, Here's, uh, here's Johnson and Sue, and they created this method of composting that the reason why it's one of my easiest or one of my favorites is because it's one of the easiest. You don't have to turn it. You don't have to worry about the proper ratio between greens and browns. Um, the only downside is it takes a year. So basically what it is, is it, it's, this is like a landscape fabric um, construction made out of like fencing very simply made, um, that is filled. You have to fill it day one with 700 pounds of organic matter of any kind. And you put, you put three PVC poles that are, have holes drilled in it down the, the center, which add air. You take those out of, after a certain time, you water it pretty constantly. And then after six months, you add, um, worms, red wiggler worms. And then after a year, you have beautiful, perfect compost that is very um, fungal rich, which I'll touch on um, a, little, a little later on, but you want the best soil you can ask for and you can have is fungal dominated soil. So this makes a high fungal dominated soil. And the research that they've been doing on this bioreactor is insane. The numbers that they get um, th what they do for their tests is they, they spread this, they spread a pound of it per acre, just one pound per acre. And it, the, it's a night and day difference to not spreading it. The yield, the soil microbial life, um, disease resistant, just one pound per acre. So they, they basically made this for like organic farmers and conventional farmers that want to transition. Um, to organic to have like an easy way to do it because all you have to do is build this leave it for a year and then it's ready and you spread this this makes 700 pounds 
of compost. So in theory, you could you could spread this over 700 acres, and it would completely change um, the microbial life of your, that, that 700 acres. So it's an incredible product. I'm actually I'm doing a couple of them in a couple of different regions to see the difference and to test it. Um, so it's, it's an awesome method. Um, another really good one that isn't technically compost is called Bakashi. Um, and this has become a kind of a new thing for people to do. It's instead of composted, it's fermented. So basically you buy this microorganism solution and you spread it on um, your, your organic matter and it ferments this organic matter, but it breaks it down incredibly fast. The, the, the differences are this, so, this um, amendment is anaerobic, it's fermented, it's fast. I've seen Bakashi turn in less than a week, um, which is incredibly, incredibly fast for any uh, type of amendment. Um, another thing though, is it has to be buried. So this isn't like a top layer, <clears throat> a top layer amendment like, like compost is. <clears throat> this has to be buried in the ground. But what I can tell you, because I've used a lot of it, is that it's very beautiful um, and it does add a lot to your soil. Um, the next aspect of ROA is cover crops, um, which are which are really cool, and I utilize them a lot. So basically, another aspect of the forest is that it's always covered with something, with plant life, or with leaves, or with dead things. It's always covered. There's not really any spots where there's just a big open area of bare soil, and this is there's a specific reason behind this. When there's bare soil and there's nothing rooted into it or growing on top of it, soil erodes incredibly fast. Now with conventional agriculture, topsoil erosion was one of the biggest problems that's happening. We're losing our topsoil faster than we are replenishing it um, with conventional agriculture. So it's estimated that if it keeps going, we'll not, we won't have um, topsoil in a while. I don't like to look at things that say things like that, but um, it's just good to be aware that there's there's topsoil depletion in conventional agriculture. Um, so this is where cover crops go in. So during off season, like the summers, or um, if you're uh, winters, depending on what climate you're in, you want to have the soil covered. Um, now, cover crops do a couple of things, and it depends on the cover crop you use they can remediate the soil, which means that they can um, bring that soil back to the, to the place it's supposed to be, bring nutrients and love back into the soil. Th this re remediation generally occurs with the, the planting of leguminous crops because legumes have um, nitrogen fixing properties in them. Nitrogen fixing plants, majority of them are, are beans, leguminous plants, hairy vetch, things like that. Um, they have an association with a bacteria in the soil, um, rhizobial bacteria to be specific, that actually takes parts of the roots of the plant itself and fixes itself to the plant and makes um, little nodules in the roots where that uh, bacteria will live and actually sequester nitrogen from the atmosphere and bring it down into the soil. Um, so most of our nitrogen in, in our earth is in the atmosphere, but the, the nitrogen in the atmosphere, the form of nitrogen that it is, isn't available for plants. So there's generally two ways where that nitrogen can get into the ground and be plant available nitrogen, which is called nitrite, nitrate. One is to be a lightning strike, Lightning strike can alter the, the chemical nature, molecule nature of nitrogen and via rain, take it down to the ground. And the second is with nitrogen fixing rhizobial bacteria. So these are incredibly, incredibly cool um, bacteria. There's a, there's a list of rhizobial uh, bacteria that live in the ground, um, but they're in, incredibly important to getting nitrogen in the ground. Nitrogen is one of the um, base um, chemicals used for a plant to grow. 
Um, so remediating in that way, adding adding nitrogen back into the soil after a season of 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 using nitrogen, um, and also um, you can use a cover crop to add biomass to a soil. So one of the ones I use is called sun hemp. Um, it's not technically a hemp, a hemp uh, plant. They just call it sun hemp. It is a leguminous plant, so it does fix nitrogen, but it also grows six, six to eight feet tall in like two months. It's really, really fast. So what I do is when it grows six feet tall, I just chop it at the base and lay it down. And there's a bunch of organic matter on your soil now. And just through the rest of the summer, it'll just decompose and just add a bunch to your soil. And it'll also cover it and suppress weeds from growing. So that's another reason why you do cover crops is so you don't, your field isn't covered in weeds. Um, some other good ones that I, I like to use and that other farmers like to use, um, winter, winter rye, winter wheat, hairy vetch. Um, sweet potatoes is a really, really good cover crop. Um, they have a vine that covers the soil. Um, it's, it's, it's also good for compaction. Um, sweet potatoes, if you're in a place that has high compaction or high clay uh, minerality in your soil, you can use um, sweet potatoes during your off season to kind of break up the soil, kind of tilling it in a natural way, uh, adding aeration back into your soil. You also, you get sweet potatoes at the end of your harvest. And also during uh, the time that it's growing, you harvest the leaves. Sweet potato leaves are very, very tasty. Um, tastes just like spinach if cooked the exact same as spinach. High, highly nutritious. Have have more nutrition than spinach you buy at the store. Um, so cover crops are really awesome. And cover crops, uh, I'll touch on this more, are also good for um, for grazing because uh, main a main aspect of ROA is not just growing growing vegetables, but also um, growing livestock if that's something that you want to do. Um, here's an example, just a, a good cross section of some cover crops um, in a soil. Um, you can see their root. Another reason why cover crops are good is because the, the rhizosphere of a plant is active, has all this microbial life when there's roots in it. When there isn't any roots in it, th th this, these microbes have nothing to do. They've lost their other halves. They've lost their friend that gave, that gave them sugars and things like that. So you, when, you're, when the crop is done, you want to keep that rhizosphere and that, that soil life going always. Crop rotation. Um, this is just simply um, rotating where you're planting your crops. And as a, as a farmer and managing and stewarding land, this is something you wanna think about proactively as you're growing, um, that crop rotation is beneficial. There are some things you don't, you don't rotate, like your perennial plants, they grow forever and they're there forever and they're beautiful and they do exactly what they need. But even, even around perennial plants, even in a forest setting, there's, there, there's some sort of crop rotation happening. The, the there's biannual plants that grow for, for certain seasons in a forest that grow and die they get moved other places via um, uh, an animal picking up a seed and pooping it somewhere else or the wind blowing and that tree dying and it grow, growing a new one somewhere else so crop rotation is also prevalent in in, in nature as well um, the, the two main ones that I, I think about when crop rotation is tomatoes and brassicas, brassicas meaning cabbage, kales, broccoli, cauliflowers. Um, tomatoes are prevalent to disease. They just, they like to be infected with disease and pests. Um, so by rotating them, you're, you're diminishing the, uh, the amount of disease that can happen the next season. And brassicas, a lot of people don't know that Brassicas actually destroy and kill fungal networks in soil. So like a kale plant will actually kill fungal networks in soil. There's, and a lot of people don't uh, know this. And a lot of people don't rotate brassicas. They keep them kind of in the same spots every year. But like I said, you want a high fungal dominated soil. So I wouldn't 
necessarily recommend growing brassicas uh, in the same spot for more than two seasons um, because you're, again, you're destroying that fungal network. What a thing you can do is uh, when you're rotating, you plant things that are kind of opposite to what the, the plants did. For example, tomatoes generally require a lot of nitrogen in what they're growing. Uh, they get really large and they have lots of green and they're really big plants once they get big and that's all the nitrogen. When they start to fruit is when they use a lot of phosphorus, um, but they get really big first and they're using a lot of nitrogen. So you wanna plant something in the soil after that actually takes nitrogen back into the soil. So that's why we, I always use beans, a leguminous nitrogen fixing plant in my tomato rows after I have tomatoes during its ne the next season. Um, so it's bringing that nitrogen, that, that atmospheric nitrogen back into the soil and making the soil beautiful again. Brassicas, um, I wouldn't necessarily plant tomatoes in your brassicas, you can, um, but you could, you could use beans. Um, using things like lettuce is also really good uh, to rotate. Um, peppers are really good also as well. And also just making sure um, you're adding um, mulch, things like that um, to the soil. And then also talk about um, the addition of mushrooms. If you just add mushrooms to the soil, you're adding that fungal um, networks back. And also if you have a high fungal dominated compost, by adding that to your soil, you're, you're helping with the destruction from the brassicas. Um, next, we're gonna talk about agroforestry. Um, so agroforestry is basically growing um, fruit trees in a forest-like setting um, for agricultural needs, uh, majority of fruit trees. Um, agroforestry is something that you do um, on your farm in addition to everything else. Um, you could, if you wanted just to go agroforestry style and just do that, um, you're welcome to do that as well. Um, but it, these systems all work really well when you do them together. Um, it, it's a beautiful thing. Now the benefits, so it's a perennial system um, and perennial systems are you know, the most efficient because you don't have to water them. You don't have to fertilize them. You don't have to weed them. Um, things like that, and they produce every single year. Um, uh, to me, like a mango tree is like uh, on many levels, um, one of the, like a perfect example of a perfect guru um, because it sits still, it doesn't move, it does everything it needs to do, and it provides everyone with beautiful, delicious fruit every single year. It provides us with shade, it provides the soil with nutrients. Um, so plant trees. <laughs> um, uh, riparian buffers. So like riparian meaning um, river uh, ecosystems. Um, so having buffers around your river ecosystems is really important for the structure and the habitat of your river. Silvopasture, this is a cool word. Um, basically, this is the addition of agroforestry and um, growing um, and, and growing livestock and managing livestock. Um, silvo, so the, the original kind of method used pigs. They would put uh, these rings on no, the nose of a pig so that it couldn't root down too deep in the ground. But they would basically let um, pigs run through um, uh, oak trees or trees that have uh, acorns and they would have them eat all the acorns, um, which would clean up the forest floor and what they would poop and they would um, kind of compact or not compact aerate by, by walking um, through and um, things like that. And it's a win-win because the pigs have food and you're cleaning you're cleaning up your section and you're fertilizing it. Um, there's a lot of different methods of silver pasture though. Pigs isn't my favorite. Um, I don't eat, I don't eat a pig. <laughs> um, there, there's, there's some good ones uh, that I'll talk about a little later. Um, windbreak, 
So having windbreak on your field is also really good. Um, boarding your, your, your field, um, the land with um, trees, um, fruit trees, will add some protection to your, your crops that are on the inside. Um, you saw the example of the land that I am steward of. Um, there was a tree surrounding the whole entire property. Um, and there's trees uh, and other areas that divide different um, um, row, vegetable rows. And this is specific. Um, alley cropping. Um, so this is growing produce on the insides of, of trees. And we'll talk about this more when we talk about syntropy a little bit more, a little bit later on. Oh, there's syntropy. Um, syntropy is my personal favorite agroforestry method. Um, this is um, kind of a niche, unknown um, agroforestry method. Um, developed by Ernst Gotch. Um, its strength comes from aligning with the power of natural succession, the tendency for nature to rehabil rehabilitate land, taking it from barren to fertile and then densely vegetated. So like if, if, um, if all the humans right now just died in the world, it wouldn't take nature a long time to just cover everything with, with green and to be like vast and beautiful. So nature just does this thing where it just abhors a vacuum and just grows everywhere it needs to, it, it can. And syntropy kind of uses that. It also uses stratification, um, which is like a, uh, how a forest, a rainforest is stratified in many different layers, seven different layers, mostly the emergent, the ones at the very top, the high right below that, the medium below that, and the low, all require different levels of light, different levels of water. Um, this is a, a, um, a, syn a syntropic farm um, before it started, this is some barren land. And they were like, we're gonna take this land and do some syntropy on it. Um, so syntropy is grown in rows. Uh, and th this is the reason I like it a lot um, compared to like a permaculture plot where a permaculture plot is very beautiful and simulates nature amazingly, um, but it, it can get hard to manage and also hard to remember where you planted things. Um, we're like, wait, what was that? What did I plant there? Um, Centropy has the rows that do the same thing. So the rows have um, usually there's a target species, meaning that the species, the emergent species, it's going to get the biggest and there's layers below it. And they're planted in um, right after each other, um, close like a forest. So this is, this is before anything was planted. Here's like um, six months after things were planted. And here is, you, you see a, a densely vegetated area that looks like you're looking at a forest, but there's, this is actually all systemized. Each, each one of these plants are planted in a specific order, planted next to a specific plant in order to do a certain thing. Um, and there's, you can walk down the sides of it and you know, like, okay, I'm on row four. I know exactly what's planted on this, on um, this row. Um, here's some other pictures. Um, here's a younger, a younger setting. Um, the two, they call them the king and queen of, of syntropy are the banana, the queen, and the eucalyptus, the queen, um, king. Um, the eucalyptus grows like a, a straight pipe um, that is, so these two plants aren't used, they're used solely for biomass. So this banana isn't used to grow a banana. It's used to chop like this and to add organic matter to the soil. And this eucalyptus isn't, isn't grown for to be pretty. It gets chopped, um, coppiced, meaning chopped across the the trunk straight across and used and mulched like this. That's its, that's its leaves. Both are really good. So in between these two is, is a fruit tree of some sort. This looks like an avocado maybe. Um, so here's, here's another view of a pathway between syntropic rows. Um, 
I just like it because it's it's it does the same thing that a forest does or a rainforest does or permaculture does in the way that it simulates nature, but it's organized in, in, a, in a beautiful way. Um, and also the, the, the trimming and pruning of a plant is incredibly vital to this system. When you cut a plant, like, like eucalyptus, for example, when you cut the head off this plant, it doesn't have any leaves, it's just like a stick. What it does is like, okay, I don't have anything to, to, to photosynthesize with right now, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to send all my energy down into the roots. And when it sends all its energy down into the roots, not only does it hold better into the ground and get stronger, but it's actually increasing that microbial life in the ground because it has to start making those, it has to start making more connections with all the microbes. Um, here's an example of a, a baby syntropic farm that I started uh, for somebody um, with my friend, Matthew Reese, who in my opinion is, uh, one of the most knowledgeable in syntropy. Um, this person uh, wanted um, a lot of space in between their rows. They're, they're, they have about 30 feet in between their syntropic rows. But you can see there's a banana. This is a, a anona, which is a sugar apple. Um, in between each one of these bananas, we planted a pigeon pea, which is a nitro nitrogen fixing shrub. In between each one of those, we planted um, a cassava. So there's a lot of things you plant. Um, and then after, after each one of these plants is a eucalyptus is planted. We're kind of small at this stage. Um, normally, syntropy is started by you plant all of these, all the seeds at once at the same time. And just naturally over time, um, there's like, they call them placenta stages where things will die and things will grow. Um, and get bigger and bigger. This, this we're planting um, plants at older stages. Next is um, Korea natural farming, um, which is a method that I like to use. Um, there's biodynamic farming and there's green natural farming. Biodynamic farming is, is really cool and really awesome to look into. Um, I just don't, I haven't utilized it a lot. Um, I don't know much about it. Um, one of the reasons why I don't utilize it a lot is because it uses a lot of animal uh, matter in their preparations, um, which I don't, I don't grow or, or use any animals um, or have any animals in my farm that are like frolicking around. Um, so I don't have the, uh, the opportunity to use that, those types of uh, method, methods, but biodynamic is pretty cool. Um, Korean natural farming is uh, what I would say a little, a little more holistic and a little more attainable. For example, for like biodynamic, there's like, there's a preparation where you like take the head of a goat and you like crack open the brains and bury it underground for like 10 days and take it out and like burn it and like do all these things that not very many people, A, want to do or two, have the option to do. Um, Korean natural farming, uh, on the other hand, is is very easy and makes a lot of sense to me. Um, so, and it was developed by um, Dr. Cho. Um, and basically Korean natural farming um, utilizes the idea of knowing plants, like plants development and stages of life and kind of relating that to our stages of life that we've gone through in our life because we're, we, me and the plant are the same. And we go through the same thing when we're um, going through different stages, like when we're young and we're babies, we're more fragile, we need our nutrients or our nutrition requirement is a little different to how I am now. Um, when I'm pregnant, not me, but when someone's pregnant, they require a little more different uh, nutrients because they're, they're how they have a baby. Um, so they're relate, Cho related, plant growing in plants to us so that we could understand plants better. And I align with that a lot. Um, some of the words used and met methods used um, in KNF is IMO, which is indigenous microorganisms. So a really easy way to harbor indigenous microorganisms into your soil, um, which is the best form of microorganisms in your soil because the more indigenous microorganisms, uh, it just makes sense. Um, you basically cook rice 
and you take this rice and you put it into a forest that's close by to you, um, preferably with less than 10 miles away from you. And um, this rice will then be covered with microorganisms and, and, and fungi and things like that. Uh, and you take this and you culture it and you can make preparations with it. You can make liquid fertilizer. Um, you can just sprinkle that rice uh, on your soil. So you're just adding uh, indigenous microorganisms to your soil. Another uh, method is FPJ, which stands for fermented plant juice, which is really cool. There's basically you take um, a plant matter and you're fermenting it with either brown sugar or jaggery and um, using that as a solution to treat disease or to fertilize. And there's actually different stages where you can harvest, for example, if, if, a, uh, if a tomato plant is suffering from a disease, you can harvest leaves from the plant itself and make an FPJ with it. It will actually cure its disease, um, which I think is just beautiful. Jadam is a book um, and method that was written by Dr. Cho's son. Um, that I think I had recommended as one of my recommended readings. Um, in that book, he discuss he discusses um, pesticides and herbicides and things like that um, made naturally um, that are at a fraction of a cost of what conventional agriculturists use. This book was generally made for like conventional agriculturalists um, to help them make natural pesticides and herbicides um, that don't uh, destroy the earth. So it's a really, really good book. And I just love both of theirs. If you read anything by either of them, they just have a beautiful philosophy about growing food and about life. And they're just beautiful people. Uh, so here's, a, here's an example of, this is from uh, Dr. Cho's K and F book. Um, he, he calls one period of plant growth a changeover period when a plant is changing uh, about the flower and about the fruit. He, he, he correlates a pregnant mother um, uh, having morning sickness and wanting something sour, like sour pickles is a common craving pregnant mothers can have. And that, that is because of the phosphorus. So when a plant is going through that morning sickness or that and, and about to create a baby, you, you feed the, the plant phosphorus. So things like that, I just find really beautiful. Um, here's, a, here's an IMO preparation that kind of goes through the steps of how to harvest and how, how to use it. Um, it's, very, it's very simple and um, I've done it a couple of times. Permaculture. So this is a big word that I'm sure everyone has heard it once in their life. Um, to me, another word that kind of has been stigmatized in uh, the last few years, um, there's, there's a lot of, sadly, uh, and unfortunately, there's a lot of people that utilize this word um, for profit um, and don't really respect the origins of where perm the word permaculture came from. Um, Bill Molson, the, who coined the word permaculture, um, basically learned everything from the uh, Aboriginal um, Tasmanian um, people uh, noticing how they grew food and cultivated things. And there's a lot of, a lot of uh, people that they just kind of, uh, you know, use per permaculture as a, as a key word to, to get people to um, buy into what they're doing or uh, things like that and not really respecting the native practices that permaculture developed from. Um, that being said, it is very beautiful and just having, giving respect to permaculture and the origins of it is, is really important, uh, in my opinion. Um, permaculture in, in, in general is the combination of permanent agriculture and permanent culture. Permanent agriculture meaning a, a, a plot of land that has permanent agriculture, meaning um, perennial plants and systems that are permanent and don't um, that change, but don't really um, move to different locations um, and mostly uses perennial plants that are permanent. And permanent culture, um, like harboring a permanent culture of growing food 
of caring for our earth, of having food sovereignty, which is incredibly important, and of cultivating love in what we do. And there's, there's a permaculture is a vast, vast um, subject that I can talk again for hours on it. We could do a separate thing just on permaculture. Um, but just, just knowing that it's um, holistic and the, the permanent agriculture and the permanent culture basically break, break it down. There's like, there's like 12 principles of permaculture uh, that describe like the mindset you should have when designing any system uh, that's permaculturally based. Um, here's, here's a, an example of like a permaculture type homestead. This was actually uh, taken from Bill Molson's permaculture handbook. Um, so the, one of the main staples are zones in permaculture. Um, these are numbered one, two, three, four. And the zone is um, basically tells you the amount of time you will be spending at a certain area. So the, the, the higher number the zone, the less time you're there. Your majority at your house, so that's one. Um, two, your, your, your gardens and things that are close by that you visit every single day. Three, the things that are a little farther away. And four, vast that you, you go once or twice a year, maybe. So the zones are really important in designing your house um, and in designing a homestead. Um, Another thing that I always tell people that want to get in permaculture and want to say like, I want to start de designing my zones. I want to start doing all this stuff. Um, I always tell them the best thing to do with any piece of land um, that you're living on is before you do anything to just live on the land for a year and to just observe, to observe everything. Okay, I observed during the winter, this back left corner of my plot gets a lot of compacted snow. And I observed during the summer that when the rain falls, it kind of goes in this way. And just writing all these things down so that when you come to design and plant things, you know exactly what the land that you're on is doing and will do during the seasons so that you don't have to, you know, uh, like remove something that you planted because of flood or things like that. You don't want to have to do it. It'll waste time and potentially waste an investment or money into what you've done. Um, so this is kind of that uh, expressed in a different way, the zones. And these zones get uh, really technical. Um, Bill Molson uses a lot of physics and like astrological things um, and geometry into his design, um, which is really cool and beautiful. Um, Here's a really cool, uh, just like tidbit of, of, of permaculture design. Um, this is a herb spiral. I've planted a few of these in my time. Basically, they're a spiral that's elevated in the center and goes down like steps as it goes down and you plant herbs in it. Oops, sorry. Um, and basically the ideology is that the, you plant the plants that require less water at the top and more water as they go down, um, as water flows down the, the spiral. And I just think it looks really cool. Um, that's just a really simple one to do. And it, and it incorporates all of the, all of the aspects of, of permaculture and design, the way it works with nature, uh, the ideology, things like that. Mushrooms, um, one of my favorite topics and things are mushrooms. Um, mushrooms, like I said, are an extremely vital part of your soil. Um, and if you had to build your soil, which if you have to do, you want a high fungal dominated soil, meaning the fungal to bacteria ratio, you want the fungal matter to be higher than your bacteria matter. Um, in count in the soil. And the reason why, well, there's a couple reasons why. There was a study done on three different types of soil. Um, there was a conventionally grown soil, there was an organically grown soil, and there was a high fungal dominated soil. 
and they 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 like sprayed the soil with um, a liquid fertilizer, like a compost tea. Um, the conventional soil lost almost 99% of that fertilizer that went through the soil. Um, the organic soil um, held only eight or so percent of that nu nutrition. But the mushroom, the fungal dominant soil held almost 100% of that nutrient in the soil. Um, so it, it's just an amazing thing to have in the soil. Um, they're important for many reasons. They communicate with the, the fungal, with the, the rhizosphere and with the root tips. They provide um, a lot of uh, life, places to live, things to eat. Um, they decompose. Um, they also, there are some mushrooms that are called mycorrhizal. Um, and these, these types of mushrooms and networks have a distinct relationship with plant roots that is millions and millions of years old. The arbuscular or endo um, my, mycorrhizal um, networks means that they actually enter into the root tips of a plant and it is theorized that this arbuscular relationship between um, plants and this, these fungal networks is what developed um, plants into, developed plants to have roots. Um, prior to plants having um, roots, they would just grow very tall and fall over and grow very tall and fall, fall over. This was millions of years ago, which caused another climactic event to happen um, and a reset. Uh, then the plants learned that if it grew their root, grew roots similar to mushrooms, then they could hold themselves in the ground. So we can basically thank all plants and trees on the earth we can, we can um, give all the credit to mushrooms for showing them what to do. Um, so very beautiful relationship they have together. Um, this is like the Stametian Stamets, really um, well-known mycologist. Um, he, he's most known for his um, advocacy on uh, medicinal mushrooms, specifically Cubendus psilocybin mushrooms and their effects, but also the, just the incorporation of mushrooms into our diet, into our health, and also into um, what we grow. So his model of, this is from his book. Um, this model just shows that, you know, we have mushrooms growing up in our, in our fields. We have places where we can, you know, um, cultivate mushrooms, do agar plates, grainy grain, things like that. Um, and just mushrooms are throughout everything. And my, one of my favorite things to see is when I'm just reaching my hand in some soil and I just see like mycelial networks in the soil. Um, if you've ever smelt soil, which I highly recommend everyone, if they ever have the opportunity just to get your nose in some soil and smell, the sweet, sweet smell that you smell in soil is mycelial networks. It is the, the fungal networks and the mushrooms that makes that sweet smell. Um, so a good sign of a high fungal soil is if it smells really sweet, if it smells sweet, you're like, okay, this has um, mycelial networks in it. That's great. Now there's a lot of different methods of growing mushrooms. Um, there's the debate of indoor versus outdoor mushrooms. Um, and this is, this depends on you. I, I do both ways. Um, you could pick one. It, um, the, the benefit of growing outdoor, of course, is you're gathering that that relationship with the soil, but it's, it's not like um, you can't incorporate your indoor mushrooms into the soil eventually over time. Um, there's some components of what you should think about if you ever wanna grow mushrooms. Um, if if um, medicinal, um, depending on what you, what you wanna grow, there's a lot of medicinal mushrooms, reishi, lion's mane, things like that. Um, edible mushrooms. Um, is also the methods of growing indoors. Um, there's, there's a few methods. The method I use the most is basically, I take a five gallon bucket, 
um, and I will fill it with what's called cocoa coir, which is basically shredded coconut fiber. Um, and I'll layer that and mix it with um, inoculated and myceliated um, wild or whole oats that I inoculated and um, drill holes into the bucket. And then I put it in what's called a Martha tent. Uh, a Martha tent is like kind of like a small greenhouse that I um, put a humidifier in it and mushrooms will grow out of the, um, of the buckets. I can show you a video of a Martha tent. Let me know if you guys can see this. Cool. So we can see uh, in this video, um, these are pink oyster mushrooms growing out of the side of a Home Depot bucket. <laughs> um, and all I did very simply, I filled it with cocoa coir and with my myceliated mushroom jar and um, waited and mushrooms will do its thing. And these are one of the best tasting mushrooms in my opinion, very nutritious. Um, uh, about growing outside, Here's an example of some mushrooms growing outside. Again, these are pink oyster mushrooms. So another thing about growing outside that you should consider is fruiting temperatures. So, there, so every mushroom, gourmet or medicinal, has a distinct fruiting temperature, meaning it'll only fruit in the range of these temperatures. So for me, I do mushrooms in South Florida where there's high humidity and high heat and a high average temperature. So the best mushroom that I found that I can grow outside is pink oyster mushrooms because their fruiting temp generally ranges between 80 and 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, that being said, if you live in a colder region, um, you actually have access to a lot more mushrooms that you can grow outside. Um, one of Paul Stamets' favorite mushrooms to grow outside is the wine cap mushroom. Um, mostly because of its um, ability to harbor and store its mycelial networks in the ground once and after it's fruited and to be able to sprout up again and keep going without the addition of, of um, inoculating the ground again. So they'll just kind of keep going forever. Um, he has ones that have been growing in his gardens for 20 or so years and just keep coming up different places and will spore and spread to other places. And um, so this is a this is a Japanese eggplant um, with some basil growing in it, um, and you can see there's a little bit of pink oyster mushrooms coming up. But also you can see that there's some ink cap mushrooms that are I didn't plant; those are just natural. So this this shows you that I have I already have a high fungal dominated soil because I have you know mushrooms coming up. So that tells me that my soil will be good enough to harbor these, these mushrooms um, in the soil. Um, here's a picture of a, a pink oyster mushroom jar that's been myceliated. Um, the way that I do this, and, and, and Paul Stamets is the one who developed this idea and method um, for people to be able to grow mushrooms at home because prior to this method, you'd have to have this huge facility with, you have to wear suits and you'd have to have HEPA filters everywhere and thousands and thousands of dollars to grow one mushroom. He, he figured out that if you take a, a mason jar and I drilled a couple holes on the top of the jar lid, um, I put a, a red gasket sealer on, the, on one hole that I will be using as my injection port and one is an open hole that I cover with micropore tape for ventilation. I, I have, these are just, these were just whole oats that I put in the jar. I screw the lid on and put it into a pressure cooker at 15 PSI for 90 minutes. And he, so Paul Simmons figured out that if you, if you pressure cook anything at 15 PSI for 90 minutes, it kills all forms of, of any life bacteria, um, um, fungus, anything mold. So we were basically making a sterile room into a, inside of a jar. 
is what you're doing. You're like simulating the, the, the suit and the HEPA filters and pressure regulators and all that stuff into a jar. Um, so it's really cool. Then all I do is I take a syringe, you can buy them. I actually have one right here to show you. Um, you can buy syringes or you can make syringes. This is a shiitake mushroom um, syringe. Um, I don't know if you can see, there's a kind of opaque liquid in there um, that has uh, mycel mycelium in it. Um, basically this broth is a nutrient solution um, that you can make. I, I always think it's easier just to buy your first syringes online if you ever wanna get the mushroom growing. Um, so this has little pieces of mycelium in it. Um, so what you do is you inject this into the jar. It comes, it comes with a, a needle and a, a white. You inject it into the, into the jar. Um, you inject some of the mycelium into the jar. And then this, this jar was just, it just looked like oats before I started. Within a matter of days, this mycelium starts to grow and spread and turns this whole jar um, white. This has like a pink hue um, because pink oyster mushrooms, mycelium have sort of a pink hue to it, which I find awesome. Um, and you can see all these little hairs. Um, once the, the jar is fully, what's called colonized um, like this, then what you can do is you can do what I did. If I'm planting it in the ground, I will dig a little furrow in the ground and sprinkle some of it like a seed cover it up and then put and then put straw on top of it or you can put mulch on top of it. Um, that's depending on the type of mushroom you're growing because it, if you ever forage for mushrooms, mushroom, different mushrooms grow in different uh, places and grow in different mediums. Um, if I'm growing it inside, I use cocoa coir and I do like a, a layer of this versus on cocoa coir. Um, so, and then another, another aspect of mushroom cultivation is um, once you have a jar like this, well, Sam, it's also figured out that you don't have to buy a syringe anymore after you have this. You can just take one of these pieces of grain that's covered in mycelium and put it into another jar of grain and it'll spread to the whole thing. So you basically have an infinite supply of mushrooms once you grow your first mushrooms. Another thing you can do is let's say you, you grow a, a, a huge lion's man head and you're like, whoa, I've never seen one that big before. You can take a piece of the lion's mane head and you can put it on a tray of agar and you can culture it that way. And once you put, it's, it's crazy how fast mycelium will grow. Even just a, a piece of the tissue of a, of a, of a mushroom, a fruiting body. You put it on the agar and it starts to spread over the whole agar tray. And then you can take, you can cut pieces of the agar and put it in the jars and it'll do the same exact thing. So that specific uh, way with the agar is called cloning. So like, it's like a form of natural selection. So with mushrooms. So a thing that I've been doing with mushrooms with pink oysters is slowly but surely um, making more, more and more resistant um, uh, and strong pink oyster strain. And that's just by my, uh, natural selection, by taking the attributes I like from certain um, uh, fruiting bodies and cloning them. Um, so now I don't have to be as cautious or sterile when I'm doing injections or things like that because I've, I've cultivated this really strong um, mushroom. Um, so next we're gonna talk about starting a farm and, and some things you should be thinking about uh, when you ever wanna to start stewarding some land. Uh, it's really important to understand the scope of what you're doing, um, how how large of a of a piece of land do you want to to farm on, um, what what are you trying to do, what who are you trying to produce for, is it for yourself, is it for your family, is it are you trying to sell something, um, things like that, all determine the management style that should be going into your farm. Um, a balance is also incredibly important in, in, in starting a farm. Um, balance in all attributes of your life. You wanna make sure that you're healthy, um, that you're, you're, you have clarity in your mind and, and your purpose, what you're trying to do, your communion with nature should be balanced. 
so that everything you're doing is succinct. Um, planning, once you are starting a farm, um, planning is also very important. If, if you're in a season that has hard frost, then you want to plan for that. You can't grow outside during those frosts, so you want to plan, okay, well, I have to grow a certain amount of vegetables, certain amount of pounds of vegetables in order to feed myself or my family or my community during this time. So planning ahead like that. There are some uh, techniques, storage crops. Um, there's two forms of storage crops. There's a storage crop that you actually harvest and you store like a potato or a root vegetable, but there's actually storage crops that it will actually store, you can store in the ground by just continuing to let it grow. For example, cassava or yucca is a great storage crop because you can keep cutting off um, the, the, the plant form, the above ground form of the plant and just keep allowing it to grow bigger and bigger until you want to harvest it. And you're like, oh, okay, uh, I need to harvest it because I'm hungry. Then you can take it out of the ground. And it, it never went bad because it's been um, growing and stored in the ground. There's also one called that's for a more colder climate, the Peru green ground apple. This is a really cool tuber. It grows these like apple shaped tubers. Um, timing is very important. Um, and that also depends on what you're doing. If, if you're in like, if you're in a place that has a very short growing season, timing is utmost because you, you have, you could have 90 days of a growing, a growing season or 80 days of a growing season and, veg, and some vegetables take 70 days to start producing fruit. So starting working back time and, and planning so that you have the things ready to go in the ground right when they're ready is really important. Timing also um, in like, I know that these French breakfast radishes take 20 days to be able to harvest. And I wanna be able, I don't want this, the soil to be bare after I harvest them. So I'm gonna start some seedlings now so that by the time that the, the French breakfast radishes are done, I'll have plants to replace them, things like that. Um, it's also a good thing to consider. Varieties is really important. One of the most important in my opinion too. Um, there are there are varieties of vegetables and fruit trees and plants that grow worse or better in some areas. So knowing your zone, your growing zone, knowing your climactic conditions um, will help you determine the varieties that you want to have, the attributes that you want to have. If you're in a more cold, you want cold climate, um, you want a more cold hardy vegetables that, that just in case can take a frost if there's a random frost or, or if you have, if you've known in the past that you were susceptible to a certain disease, you can have varieties that are more resistant to certain diseases in your area. So here's a, here's a picture of um, my parents' front yard. Uh, before this was there, it was all grass. And I wanted to help my parents um, be more self-sufficient for themselves, uh, to have better access to food, good food, um, and just to get rid of grass. Um, I'm not against all grass, but lawns are the most irrigated crop in the United States, and it's not anything we eat. So um, to me, lawns um, are, are sort of a waste. So instead, um, what my parents' front yard now has is this list of plants on the right uh, is all in their front yard. Um, so I'll read a couple of them to you and they all have a purpose and they all do a certain thing. Um, uh, Australian mint, for example, is also called toilet paper plant because you can use it as toilet paper. It's very soft, it smells like mint. Um, African blue basil is the world's only perennial basil. It'll never seed. It grows incredibly well. This, this bottom right here, that's, that's African blue basil. Um, it grows huge. You can see a mango right there, mango tree. You can see a lemongrass. Um, this is a loofah, a loofah sponge. So it's not only growing um, food, but it's also growing products that we buy to store quite regularly. 
a loofah sponge is a really easy plant to grow um, and it grows a loofah. Um, really, really, really nice loofah. Um, longevity spinach is a, it's a perennial um, spinach that grows across the ground and it's called longevity spinach because people say that if you eat it, you'll live forever. Um, stevia, so a sweetener. So cutting out the need for, to buy sugar at the store, um, you have stevia. Stevia, the plant is 10,000 times sweeter than sugar. Um, so one leaf can sweeten a, a whole jug of lemonade. Um, Lipia alba is a tea, it's a medicinal tea. Um, it's, a, it's a mild sedative. Black peppercorn is a peppercorn spice, hummingbird tree is a nitrogen fixer. So there's, so all of these um, plants work together and also provide different things for the earth, but also uh, my parents for their health. <clears throat> in the front, there's a lot of uh, native pollinate, pollinating attractive um, plants, flowers. I always say that it's incredibly important to have native plants in any situation that you're growing. Um, you'll harbor all those native insects and bugs that will help pollinate and actually um, remove pests. For example, um, I've seen it hundreds of times. Uh, a tomato plant um, it can be destroyed and decimated by what's called a hornworm, which is a big um, caterpillar that will go on a plant and can wipe out a tomato plant like that overnight. It can wipe out the whole plant. Um, but if you have um, a certain flower, you can attract a parasitic wasp that can, will actually lay its eggs on the caterpillar and kill the caterpillar. Um, so nature works in that way. It's always a balance. Um, I, I, I've, I've found that my best management practice for pests is to just observe and be patient. Um, I've always found that that's, I mean, in life also, but for, for pest management, if you just let nature, if you have a system that's, that's diverse with many different crops and, and has a force-like setting, nature will do what it does and it will balance. If there's a pest, it'll come, its predator will come and then it'll be fine. Um, so here, here you see that this is, there's a lot of plants here just in the front yard and there's, it's providing my parents with, with a lot of, of good, good things. Um, no, it's not providing them with 100% of their food intake, um, but that's, I don't think that's um, what we should be thinking about. Um, I think that even just growing one plant and like parsley and just not buying parsley from the store for one year um, would do a lot more than you think it would do. Um, so just having that mindset is, is good. Um, and here's, here's a, a couple more pictures of um, the farm I steward. Um, so this is a little different. It's designed a little differently. This is designed to produce lots of um, food for people. Um, so the space is a lot larger. Um, so here on the right, you see there's no same crop grown next to each other. Next to each other. Um, this middle crop actually is um, tomatoes that I have um, inoculated with pink oyster mushrooms. Um, one of the, for my master's research, I am doing a study on the benefit of growing pink oyster mushrooms with tomatoes and seeing um, if it can prolong the season for tomatoes, meaning can grow um, a longer season. So that's uh, one of the experiments uh, that I've been doing. Um, on the left, you can see a bunch of different um, tuber root vegetables watermelon radishes, turnips, um, more turnips, um, more radishes, daikon radishes, all different and all beautiful. Um, and another thing you see is like some of the leaves have holes in it or some of the plants aren't like perfect um, from what you buy at the store, um, which is also a sign that I love to see. Um, when you're buying produce from the store and you see that the leaves in the, in the, the um, produce is perfect, meaning no blemishes. To me, that's a warning sign. Um, when, a, when a plant 
is eaten by something, it means that the plant was good and that the pest liked it and it wanted to eat it. And that means that I want to eat it because the, the pest wanted to eat it and the bug wanted to eat it. Also, there's a, there's a process, a plant um, process called xenohormesis that they're still doing studies on. But basically, plants have a similar immune response to humans in the way that the immune system works. When there is some sort of trigger of disease, a plant will have an immune response reaction, and it will actually make more nutrient and vitamins in themselves to boost their immune system, kind of the same thing that we do. So when you're eating the plant that has been had whole on it or been eaten by pests, you're getting all of that nutrients. So it's, it's more beneficial for you tenfold to be eating a plant that has <laughs> a, something eaten out of it because the plant's gone through this response. But also it's a sign that we didn't spray anything on our plants to prevent any pests from going on it um, and eating it. So that's also a good sign for you. Bugs are incredibly smart and they won't, they won't go onto a plant that has a chemical on it and eat it because they'll die. So they've learned. Um, so another, another really good sign for us as consumers when we're buying things. Um, another thing I want to touch on is, is uh, in consuming is um, uh, going back to conventional agriculture. I mean, you could blame, you can put blame on a lot on the system, on a lot of people or the government and things like that. But we as consumers also have a part of the blame in what we buy. Um, I always recommend people wherever they are in the world to, to try their best to, to buy things that are in season in their area. Um, one, of the way, one of the reasons why conventional agriculturalists grow in the way that they do is because of our demand of wanting strawberries all year round or wanting cucumbers all year round or wanting lettuce all year round. In a normal setting, these plants don't grow all year round. So they've had to been modified, grown in unconventional, weird ways to, to produce the demand that we have for them. So what we can do as consumers is say, okay, where am I in the world right now? What is the season? Um, I will buy that, those vegetables in season. And if everyone started to do that, then it would, it would reduce the demand that we have um, for having you know, these plants all year round. Um, another thing that I find interesting in supermarkets is that you basically see the same vegetables every single time you go to a supermarket. It's the same like 20 or so vegetables that you see or five or six fruits that you see, usually from the same um, producers. One of the things that, that I'm so passionate about and what got, got me to be so passionate about growing food was the diversity of, of um, cultivars that you can grow and how beautiful and different they are than from the store. For example, this watermelon radish right here is, I mean, incredibly beautiful and tasty plant. You cut it in half, it looks like a watermelon on the inside. And there's a lot of people that have never experienced that. Or for fruit, um, I mean, in, in Sunny South Florida, I can grow a wide variety of um, different tropical fruits that the majority of the world has never heard of or tasted. There are fruits like mame that taste like sweet potato pie on the inside and will just change your mind or blow your mind to any apple that you've ever had. Um, the mangoes, there's 200 varieties of mangoes um, alone in the world, all completely different, all taste different. Um, bananas. We have one banana that we buy at the store. I grow 30 different varieties of bananas and they all taste completely different. And they're all uh, 10 times better than tasting than anything you buy at the store. Um, one banana I grow, it's called a Namwa banana. It tastes like bluebell vanilla ice cream. It's, it, it's insane. So all these things that I love and I've been so passionate about to get me to be more passionate about like exposing people to this and, and getting uh, sharing my knowledge so that people can learn and experience these things for themselves um, and grow these varieties. Um, uh, a website I really like uh, as a farmer um, for seeds is Johnny is Selected Seeds and um, Rare Seeds, Baker's Creek Seeds, they're the same. Um, 
they're both really good sites and have um, a wide array, array of different um, seeds. And Johnny's, for example, they, they usually have little graphs where you can click on it and it'll tell you attributes of different plants of like, that you can click on like indeterminate tomatoes and then you can click on this graph and it can go down every single one of the indeterminate tomatoes and tell you, this one's more frost hardy. This one is more resistant to this. So you can be like, oh, okay. Uh, and then like gauge it to, to where you're growing. And, um, and, it, and it'd be better for you. For me, for example, I grow a majority of indeterminate tomatoes. So there's two main tomato branches. There's determinate and there's indeterminate. Indeterminate are like your cherry tomatoes and indeterminate meaning that they never stop growing. They'll keep growing big, big vines. Determinate is our plants that will grow to a certain size, produce all of their fruit and be done. So it's like your beefsteak tomatoes. So I grow a majority of indeterminate tomato, cherry tomatoes, because the reason why I grow them for what I'm doing is trying to grow food for people is they keep producing fruit, grow bigger and bigger. And I can have, I, I can have a almost a seven, eight month harvest of tomatoes um, with indeterminate tomatoes, which is a beautiful, long, a crazy long time for tomatoes to be grown um, and to be producing. So um, now we'll talk about, oh, yes. Before you, before you proceed, Noah, um, would you mind if we all take a, like a 15 minute bio break? No. This is, this is so fabulous so far, but I don't know if my bladder can handle it <laughs> <laughs> any longer waiting, but um, yeah, you're, this is amazing. Um, awesome. But yeah, let's pause. Let's. Oh, first I wanted to, um, I forgot to use this prop when I was talking about starting a farm that I brought. Um, this is called a soil pocker. Um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with it, um, but basically it's, uh, it's a tool used for starting seeds. So you can see on the inside, there's these little um, kind of nipple looking things. Um, basically what you do is you get soil mixture. Um, there's a few mixtures that you can make. Um, I personally use a mixture um, that I make, which is 50% compost and 50% um, sifted um, native soil. But depending on where you are in the world, that would ad adjust. If you're if you're just a home gardener, um, I recommend a website called Tilth. Um, Tilth.com. They are out of. Um, Ohio, I believe. They have a composting facility and um, they make soil mixes and they're really, really, really good soil mixes. The best that I've ever used and ever have known. They're all, they make their own compost. They're mixed with biochar, um, bone meal, really good stuff. And all you have to do is use their mixture. You don't have to add anything to it. Um, so you wet, you wet your soil mixture really heavily. You use this uh, machine and you pick up the soil and then you, push it out like that and it makes perfect little blocks of soil that have holes in it ready for you to sow seeds. And the benefit of soil blocks, one, is you don't have to use plastic um, soil trays to grow your um, plants. Two, um, because it's soil uh, on the outside, it's a block of soil. Um, the soil block does something called air pruning, the roots, meaning that the roots won't go past the soil. It'll stay confined within the, the soil block. Um, which is good because one, when you plant the, the soil block, the seedling in the ground, it will then root very quickly into the ground and your transition period for, um, from soil block to growing in the soil um, is a lot um, less harsh and there's no sagging days or them being sad or things like that. And two, they don't get root bound. Um, root bound is when uh, the roots of plants will bound up um, inside of a pot or inside of a little soil tray and get tangled. Um, you never see root bound in the ground because it has space to grow. But when you have this root bound ball and you plant it in the ground, it takes a while for that plant to unravel itself and then spread out. Um, so let's, uh, I love soil blocks. I recommend everyone getting a soil blocker. The 
the one I recommend um, is the originator. It's called it's a Ladbrook, L A D B R O O K E. Um, it's made in London, England, um, and um, works really well. They also have ones that are um, three of these stacked next to each other. You can do it at a time. They also have ones that are um, this is like a, a two inch one. They also have one that are one inch. It's like a 20 soil block. They have a four inch one. Um, so really good uh, thing. I forgot to use that when I was talking about um, starting a farm, um, but I just love those. I also wanted to show you this, Let me share my screen. Quick question about the soil blocks. Like how do they stay yeah. together once you punch them out? Like, do they stay intact? Yeah. So you wet, you wet the soil mixture um, so that it, when you squeeze the soil, it, it like drips out water and you compress it really, really uh, a lot when you're making these soil blocks and they'll stay. I, I wish, I think I have a picture. I can probably find a picture of like a soil block that has a plant growing in it, growing out of it. Um, the cool thing, they stay together perfectly. They're like perfect little cubes of soil. They're like little tasty little morsels. Um, and plants can survive in them for a really long time. And they're just really uh they're 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 nice. If you're if you found that your soil block is crumbling when you're making them, then your your soil mixture is just a little off. Um that's why I just recommend people to first start with that that tilth that you can buy because it's perfect, it doesn't need anything. And the the there's like a recipe that's like can be very technical. Um so that's why I recommend that. That's a good question because, and also the first, the first few ones you make might fall apart, but it's just like getting the, the pressure down and the compaction and then they'll be fine. And also you don't have to cover, there's a, it makes like a little different where the seed is. You don't have to like cover that up with anything. Um, the seed will germinate perfectly fine in there. And also I, what I like to do is I like to sprinkle vermiculite on top of my soil blocks. It just adds a, another layer of moisture retention into it um my sister just sent me this picture of my parents yard so that this was um their this was their tomato uh place uh, this season and this summer i told them what you should do during over the summer is you should do a cover crop of some beans so i gave them a cow pea um, which is black eyed pea which i uh grew and saved the seeds for really good one to save seeds for and told them to grow it and now my sister's out there harvesting um some green beans um if you if you want to then there's, here's some sweet potato right here and look there's some grass um if you want to do do it to to gather the most nitrogen in your soil i would what i would have done is what right when the bean plant flowered i would cut the plant because right at its flowering stage, the, the actual plant itself has the most nitro available nitrogen in the actual plant. So I would have cut the plant. And that, that's only if I, if I wanted, if like I had a place that needed, that I knew it was like abused for a while and I just needed to get the most nitrogen in that land, in that part of land, that's what I would do. But this is still harboring nitrogen through nitrogen fixation. Also wanted to show a video of, um, this is, so for those that don't know, I'm currently at the um, Baba Neem Karoli Ashram in Taos, New Mexico, one of their um, farmers there, here. Um, this is uh, the one of the large greenhouses. Um, I just wanted to show you a quick video of what it looks like right now. The, this is a majority of tomatoes because um, Indian cooking uses a lot of tomatoes. But also, there's it's still grown within a polyculture, even even if we're trying to grow majority of tomatoes in here. For example, this is a zucchini that's growing behind, in between some tomato plants. And also, we have specific plants grown in here, like this one is a nasturtium, which is an edible flower, edible leaf um, plant that actually um, helps with pests. Um, planted it's a couple of them planted with tomatoes. So now we're talking about um, our animals, um, the animal part of ROA. 
Um, if you ever want to incorporate animals, I always think that it's good to incorporate animals, even if you're not specifically like they're harvesting them um, for meat. Um, uh, chickens are, are great, but also um, you should be harboring the wildlife that's around you as well. Wild native birds and insects and things like that. They're all your friends and they'll all do important things and you should be sharing with them because it's, it's we're all one and we're all living on the same land and it's it's a, it's a good practice. Um, so again, silvopasture is that agroforestry technique that I was touching on earlier. Now, the other methods I talked about on pigs, uh, another method is using, you can use goats um, or you can use sheep. Um, and, and another method is using chickens. Um, you can use chickens, uh, for a lot of different things. Um, you can use them uh, at a specific time during your gardening period to come into your garden and actually remove pests from plants. Um, I've never actually done this because I've been too afraid that they would just decimate everything, but I've known people that have done it and have done it successfully. Um, you can also do it with ducks as well. Um, a big aspect of ROA is rotational grazing. Um, this is specific mostly to cattle and ruminant animals, uh, animals that have multiple chambered stomachs. Um, rotational grazing is just a pra the practice of having um, several paddocks or sectioned off um, pieces of pasture that you or rotate your um, livestock through during the season in order for you to um, rest certain portions of land as they rotate through. Um, another example of rotational grazing is a little more intensive. It's called the lead, lead and follow method. Um, this is where you have specific animals that will rotate during in a certain order, like a follow the leader type order um, that will all do certain things. Um, one of them being you start with chickens, the chickens will scratch and they'll peck and they'll eat and they'll poop and they'll take up all those seeds. Um, and then uh, the next one will be like um, a, uh, a baby calf, a baby cow. Um, baby cows instinctively only eat the top section of grass because it has the most nutrients in it, leaving the last, the, 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 the caboose to be the, the big cows that will eat the, all the grass. And you do that again, the chickens come through and they fertilize and they get the grass growing again, they scratch and they aerate. So that's kind of a lead follow type rotational grazing, um, really good method. Um, manure is can be a really, really uh, important aspect of adding nutrients um, to your soil. Um, I know a lot of farmers that do like kind of a vegan um, uh, management style where they don't use any manure, um, which can work uh, good, but also, I mean, Manure is also really good and there's a lot of it. And <laughs> um, a lot of animals produce really good manure. There's, there's, there's two different forms of manure. There's a cold manure and a hot manure. Hot manure come from ruminant animals, cows, and hot meaning that it has to be aged in order for you to safely use it on your rows. Um, usually aged for a year or so, depending on where you are. Um, and then there's cold manure manure like alpaca and llamas and rabbits will poop out manure that you can literally poop, plant into as they poop. Like you can follow behind them with seeds and plant into the ground um, in their poop. So um, both are good, both, they're just different. Um, my favorite is composted chicken manure. Um, that's just what I've used. So manure is also really important to have. Even if you, if you just, if you're not harvesting meat, you could have you could have chickens that you could use in so many different ways, and you could benefit them, and they could benefit you, and it's a it's a it can be a beautiful relationship you have with these friends on your farm. Um, bees. Um, now this one this this bees are uh, an edgy topic nowadays for a few reasons. Um, I, I've gone back and forth with my ethics behind beekeeping. I will say that if you ever want to get into beekeeping, I would say make sure that you have enough plants and, and 
and um, plants that bloom and have flowers and have lots of pollen, enough that could, can be enough for your bees. Um, in, in actuality, you want way more than that because there's also all the other um, native insects that need pollen and need nectar as well. Um, and I also recommend if anyone wants to go into beekeeping to use a Langstroth hive. It's like the most, it's the least invasive um, beekeeping method. Um, and also, so a lot of people don't know that bees aren't native to the United States. Um, we, they were actually brought here. Um, and when they were brought here, since they've been brought here, 90% um, of the native pollinating insects that were in the Americas um, are now extinct. Um, so there's, there's, there's that to think about. And there's also, right now there's big, um, there's a widespread disease happening with beekeeping and bees where bees will abscond, meaning they'll just leave or they'll just all die. Um, and that's mostly due to the fact that the methods used for harvesting bee, for harvesting honey, um, and also bees generally will, are, are, they don't stay in one place for a very long time. When they, when they grow too large, they'll move. Um, when it gets too hot, they'll move, things like that. Um, so keeping them in one place is just making them more um, susceptible to disease. So if, if I was going to be, have honey uh, or harvest honey, um, or have bees, uh, the way I do it personally is I actually just go um, and we'll get removed um, hive from people for free that that hives have um, migrated to um, I'll, and I'll just put them on my on the on the land and um, if if they leave they leave and if not they not and I generally never ever will harvest any honey from them um, and that's just that's just my uh, personal thing if I ever do it's like a very small amount and it's like um, sacred um, that's just my, my bee philosophy. Uh, here's a little uh, diagram of a chicken and its attributes, its products, and behaviors, and its needs, um, intrinsic values, characteristics. Uh, so these are like things you should be considering when you have, when you have livestock or, or just any kind of plant. What, they, what the plant needs, what you, what it can give you, what you can give it, how you, how you can work together. Um, so how our way can be implemented into a circular community. Um, so I think that, I think it's amazing that you've allowed me to come here and, and speak to you about our way. Um, because not a lot of people really know about ROA or how to implement it or how to use it into a system. And I think it can be very holistic and, and awesome just mindset to have when having a community come together. I mean, food is incredibly important in a community, arguably it's the most important thing um, for a community. Um, so some of the things I was thinking about um, for a community was to had to have goals, like set set goals of what um, you want to have uh, maybe every year or within a certain amount of time. You could either look at it like, okay, um, we want to produce forty percent of our of our intake of our, our caloric intake this year, and next year we want to produce fifty percent of our caloric intake. Um, things like that, I think, are a good thing to think about. I don't think you should be hyper focused on that because that could uh, get you obsessed with like percentage when it, it's it's not the biggest deal, but it should be something to be considering. Um, and then if you want to go 100% of what eventually of what you're you're consuming, then you you have to you know plan for that and learn uh, in your community what you need to do. And that goes with like management. Um, in, in a community, uh, you can't just have a community like this. I feel like you can't just have um, one or two people farming. I think it has to be a community effort where everyone knows and understands every aspect of, of, of growing and, and harvesting and, 
cooking and things like that. So they're all, everyone's on the same page um, with food production and can, you know, go into different spots and, and, and notice different things that other people just didn't notice that day or um, so it's all seamless and works beautifully. But that being said, I, I found that a lot of my, the knowledge, basically all of it came from just observing um, nature and learning from my mistakes that I've made. Um, nature is the greatest teacher because it'll, it'll tell you that you did something wrong. Um, that what you did wasn't right for nature. It didn't work in nature. So like, okay, that didn't work. I'm going to try something else. Um, so learning by doing is, is really important. And um, yeah, just, you can learn everything one by just observing nature and looking at a forest and knowing just observing every aspect of a forest setting, seeing what it does perfectly. Um, and then just learning by doing, just getting your hands in the soil and be like, okay, this variety um, didn't produce this as well this year. Let's try a different variety. Or you compared these two varieties, this variety of broccoli produced 20% more yield than this variety. So let's just let's go with this one for the next season. Um, uh, which are all important things in, in management as well. Uh, if you wanna like have enough food for community, and things like that. There's always variables that happen. And that's always something that I've, I've learned as well. You could be like, you could, you could say in your mind that you're hundred percent sure that you're going to get this yield because you've done it so many times, but then like a hurricane can come or a flood can come and things like that can happen. So it's always good to just plan and just expect for the best. Um, but know that things can happen and always just have backup plans for food as well. Like having dry goods um, is something I've been getting into now is um, harvesting and drying goods um, like beans and grains, amaranth, quinoa, things like that are really easily grown and you can have them just in case uh, this crop doesn't work out. You're planning on having this crop um, for a meal for three or four days for your community, well, you have this backup, you know, rice or this backup black beans that you dried from last season that you can have for your community um, just in case things like that happen. And then supplementing in all different aspects too, having the mushrooms, having the fruit, um, seasonal fruit and, and things like that. I like to, I like to plan like fruit consumption based around like seasons. Um, if you know, like, during the summer, we usually tend to need more fruit and more water. Um, so we want to be planting things, watermelon, things like that, um, that will satisfy um, our needs during seasons. In the winter time, we're, we're a little, we're not as energized. We don't need as much, um, but we need, we need more fat. So having uh, plants that have more natural fat protein in them um, during those times is good as well. So there's a lot of aspects and facets to growing food. There's not just one path. Um, the non-soil applications of growing food, i.e. aquaponics and hydroponics are technically not ROA because they don't use soil. Um, so they're not considered in the umbrella of ROA. Um, aquaponics is the combination of hydroponics and aquaculture. And aquaculture is um, growing fish. Um, I really love aquaponics. Um, one, if you do it in a, in a more sustainable way, uh, like the way I do it is I grow uh, the fish's food. I use blue tilapia. I use duckweed, um, which is an incredible plant that grows incredibly fast without any additives. It grows on the surface of water um, to feed them. Um, you, have, you, can, you have season extension when it's really hot. Um, you have, you can, if it's in a, a greenhouse, you can grow all year round. Um, and you can have a harvestable fish, uh, another source of protein, if that's what something you desire. Hydroponics, um, I personally don't recommend. Um, it's, it's really cool because it can grow stuff really fast indoors and go vertical. Um, 
but I just don't think that the amount of chemical um, and energy needed to produce the crop justifies um, the product you're getting. Um, but I, I highly recommend to do your own due diligence and research it the way that you want to do it. I've, I've used hydroponics before in the past and it's worked beautiful, beautifully, like almost too beautifully um, and fast. So just it's up to you. Um, market gardening is gardening specifically for the idea of selling at a farmer's market or in a market or local restaurants. Um, so that's like, like the demographic and, and where you are and the restaurants around you. And it's not, it's not really growing like a whole, a full complete diet. Um, food forestry um, and, and market gardening is more about, you know, high yield, things like that. Um, food forests, um, again, I recommend just incorporating food forests in general or some sort of perennial system in general um, into all settings. Um, medicinal herbs are really important. Um, I recommend just looking into medicinal herbs. I mean, all of our medicine comes has come from herbs uh, that we consume. And if you're in a community that's growing um, food, you might as well be growing medicine as well. Um, and also, I mean, good food is also medicine, but also in, in times where you need something else, there are herbs that can save your life. Um, so having a section for medicinal herbs, I highly recommend. Um, so I, um, I've done re research on gardening just in general, but also how gardening um, can help many different things um, in us and in, and in the earth. Um, the soil actually has microbes in it um, that has been proved to um, reduce or even cure depressive symptoms and mental illnesses. Um, there's been studies on a, a tribe in Africa uh, with their soil. I forgot the exact name of the bacteria in the soil um, with similar results. Um, so just getting your hands in the soil um, can be so good for you. <laughs> it's like touching the soil um, and revitalizing with the earth. Um, also with our gut, um, I've read that some of the best probiotics you can have are soil-based probiotics um, because a good soil ecosystem has billions and trillions and trillions of microbes in it that are beneficial for our gut. Um, so if, you, if you're growing good food, you know what you're putting into it, I always recommend just take a carrot out of the ground and don't wash it. And that could be your probiotic for the day. Just eat the carrot covered in soil. Um, and it's a beautiful thing. I mean, and even uh, preg pregnant mothers are, have been known to crave soil and that's because of the minerality uh, in it that can be beneficial. Uh, I wanted to talk, just touch on some of the spiritual practices that I bring into uh, to my own practice. And I recommend that everyone kind of just has their own spiritual practice in, when, when, you're, when you're with the land, when with the land. Um, I do Agni Hotra, um, which is a fire ceremony. Um, basically, you burn um, cow dung in a specifically designed copper pyramid. Um, and you offer um, rice and ghee to this cow dung. Um, and it does a couple things. Um, uh, scientifically, the ash um, after that process is called vibhuti, and it's actually um, incredibly nutrient and really good for plants. Um, another thing that is being studied is Agni Hosha's effect on your, your like circumference and like consciousness. And um, it also can cloud seed um, for rain. It also can add uh, and increase microbial life in the soil just by doing Agni Hosha every morning and night in the same space. Um, Agni Hotra is a Vedic, um, it's called Yagya or spiritual practice that anyone can do. There's no religious affiliation or connection. Um, it's, it's called the Householder's Yagya because it, anyone can do it. Um, and I highly recommend everyone 
just look into it or just look it up or even try it. Um, there's, a, there's a mantra associated with it. Um, and it's a really good just like conscious meditation type practice. Um, and you get really good uh, kind of biochar amendment after you're done. Um, and um, another thing, another practice and ideology I have is just knowing that I am one with everything and knowing everything is one with me and that we're all connected. So just, just thinking about that, when everything I'm doing when I'm touching the soil, knowing that I'm one with the soil, when I'm putting a plant in the ground, knowing that me and that plant are the same, um, has helped a lot with, I, I think, with both me and the plant and with everything I've, I've done. Um, I listen and play Gandharva Vade, um, which is a specific um, auspicious music um, that was described in the, in the Vedas as being like really, really good to listen to for not just like our minds, but of plants and of the earth, it's healing of the earth. Um, so I also recommend everyone just listening to Gandharva Vade um, when they have a chance and also playing it for their gardens. Um, uh, it's very soothing and nice. And then also just in general, just having an abundance of love to give. You give the love to the plants and the plants will give you the love right back. It's a beautiful thing. Um, telling every plant and everything that you, you're with, that you love it, uh, is, is, is a beautiful practice. Um, so that's, that's the end of the uh, presentation. Um, I want to end with a, a mantra. Say, Loka Samasta Sukhino Bhavantu, which means may all beings everywhere be happy and free. And may the thoughts, words of my own life contribute in some way to that happiness and to the freedom for all. And I just want to say thank you, everybody, for being here and giving me the opportunity to speak about um, what I love and uh, for listening. And I'd love to have any questions. Thank you so much, Noah. This was just beautiful, enlightening, and encouraging, and inspiring, and um, love your heart and your passion for, for the plant people and the tree people and the more than human world as well as the human world. It's really beautiful. Thank you. Um, so there's... there's um, Whenever you have a question, you can just unmute yourself and ask questions. And um, I'll keep it, uh, the recording going until it tells me that I can't do it anymore. <laughs> I have a lot of questions, but I'm gonna wait until Jason or Tyler. Okay, I'll jump in here. Uh, thank you so much, Noah. That was a really wonderful presentation and inspiring and all the things that Lisa Marie just said. And I had a vision for you giving this presentation actually when we first started talking when we met at Earthship Biotexture because um, everything I was hearing was so relevant to what we've been working with. And um, I really loved your passion and enthusiasm for what you do. And this really brought together so many things that, like I said, that we've been working with, like the biggest little farm, one straw revolution, fantastic fungi. Um, there's the seed documentary. I think seed uh, untold story maybe was the name of it. Um, or maybe that's something that Lisa Marie and I watched on our own, but nonetheless, it, it brought so many things together. And um, I, I have a lot of questions too, but I'll, I'll just do one at a time and um, awesome. uh, but yeah th thanks again so much for your time and having such a well-organized presentation to give to us um, so I guess the first question I have is what are uh, what is the role of greenhouse growing in ROA because I, I noticed that you did use greenhouses and it seems like they can kind of change the dynamic of what is in season and what is not in season by making it in season all the time. But I'm just kind of curious about how greenhouses fit in. And also because it's related to our Earthship field study. And of course, it's a major component of Earthships. Yeah, for sure. Um, 
greenhouses are, are very important. I think it mostly depends on the region where you're at. Um, for example, like when I'm in Florida, I, I the only reason I use a greenhouse is to actually limit the amount of sun um, for seedlings. So I'm actually, I'm not trying to heat up an area or keep a sustained temperature. I'm just using it to reduce the amount of UV light that's actually coming through um, this area. The, the sides, all the sides are open um, for on, on the greenhouse in Florida. So it's not for keeping in warmth or anything. But here it's completely different um, is, is for when it gets to a frosting temperature, you can have a sustainable um, crop and that won't perish and freeze. Um, that being said, um, greenhouses can be, uh, if not made in like a sustainable way, can be very costly and use a lot of energy. Um, you can use a lot of gas, if you're using gas. Uh, there's a lot of sustainable ways to, to make a greenhouse. We've learned one of the one of the ways. Um, there's a lot more, um, but they are vital, and I think they're vital. If you if your community is going to be in a place where there is a frost, it's it's vital to have a place where you can grow all year round. Um, because e even if even if you can grow and store enough food to last throughout the winter. Um, I personally believe that we need fresh produce in our lives um, during winter months. Um, so I think even just having an area where you can grow lettuces um, and keeping the lettuces above freezing um, would be a good, good thing. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I'll, I'll stop with just that question for now and All right. let the others go. We do like a round robin. <laughs> All right, well, um, yeah, Noah, thank you for sharing all of that. It's like you cover a lot of ground there. Kailan, you have to come closer to your microphone because you're coming in and out. Uh, okay, how about now? Perfect. Yes. Is this good? Okay, all right, I'll, st <laughs> I'll start over. Um, did you all catch the part about round robin? Yes, yes, we got okay. that. And all let right, Noah so. let Noah who you are, where you're at, what you do with plants, what you do. Oh yeah, that's a great idea. Um, so uh, I so my name is Tylon. I am currently in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. I think it's USDA Zone Seven A, I believe. Um, and uh, I'm about a block from the Susquehanna River. And um, I've been here about two years right now. I'm staying uh, with my parents, kind of uh, moved here when COVID started. So before that, I was living in New York. And um, so I moved to New York for grad school studying plant chemistry and um, finished that up about a year ago. Um, so these days, what I'm doing with plants, you know, I've, I've been like tending to the garden here. Um, actually, when we had a buyer break, I went out like uh, uh, like threw some seeds out there on the ground because it's about to rain later. Um, and then like I harvested what did I? Oh yeah, I harvested some uh, some curly dock seeds. I want to kind of spread them around. Um, I like I like eating the leaves. So yeah, I, I like plants and and gardening and. Uh, and like nature and stuff like that so yeah and i i really enjoyed your talk um i think you like covered a lot of ground and touched on a lot of things that i'm interested in and you know i could really feel like your enthusiasm coming through like got me excited so really grateful for that um and i have a few questions too the one i have right now the, the first one that came up for me is um, so like our, our next door neighbors, you know, cleared out, they just moved into their house, like, uh, maybe six months ago and they cleared out, you know, a bunch of their property. And a lot of it was like English Ivy. 
And I, I, I generally like to collect like yard waste from people to like build up the soil in my own garden. But I was kind of wary of, you know, of taking like the English ivy clippings. But I'm curious if you met, you were mentioning with uh, composting that if you do it right, the temperature, I think in the second phase will be high enough to kill a lot of the seeds. I mean, does that also apply to English ivy? Like if you did it that way, would it render the English ivy like, uh, would it kill it basically? It's a really good question. Um, my rule of thumb with, with things like that is, if I am going to do it, there's an, there, there is a method, there's like a high, they're called like solar ovens kind of. Um, and they're actually, they're designed to, to break down um, plant matter um, that needs a little more than just general composting and you can build them. Um, I can find a link for one and, and send you it. Um, they, get, they get up to like 180 degrees, 200 degrees inside these little boxes. Um, but my rule of thumb is um, I generally will not um, put weeds in my compost. Um, what, just because you never know. Um, and it's not that I'll throw the weeds away. I'll just weed and put them in the center of, of rows and, and just let them die. Um, or I'll make a separate pile somewhere else. Um, but I, I think my rule of thumb is always to err on the, on the side of, of just being safe. And if I'm like not a hundred percent that I can kill all the weed seeds or get it hot enough, um, then I just, I won't, but you could also, you could also do it and put it in a place where you're not intending on growing something heavy, or you're not really worried about there being weeds. Um, the Ivy though is pretty crazy or can be so. Um, I would, I would err on the side of safety on that. <laughs> that makes sense. I'm just wondering like what I could use it for. I and mean, I guess like, if you I really make wanted... an FPJ with it. Oh, what? If, if, if you look up um, Korean natural farming, FPJ um, or fermented plant juice, Basically, all you do is you'll take all that matter and you put it in like a, a trash can with a bunch of brown sugar um, and it'll make a liquid. Um, it'll dissolve all of it, basically. And that liquid you could use as a fertilizer. Oh, and so that would kill it because it's like dissolving it all. Yeah. And then you, you just wouldn't use the, the matter that's left. You, you dispose oh, okay. of it Oh, interesting. Cool. That was, that was thinking good. You make... Oh, sorry. What was that? The, the the liquid that comes out of that fermentation is really really good it has like lactobacillus and things like that in it cool yeah i was thinking of just like maybe burn it or make biochar but another another really good option you could do yeah Ash. cool thanks mm -hmm. really great questions I'm not muting because I don't know if the sound will um, disappear on our recording. <laughs> but um, ah, really good questions. So I don't know this term, Noah. Eutrophication. You eutrophication. Know, yeah, eutrophication. Can you describe? Yeah. It? Yeah, I'll just I'll describe it as best I can. <laughs> um, basically, it's a process where there is an X, is it, it starts with an algal bloom, um, where there's an excess amount of plant life in, a, um, in, a, in the ocean. And this excess amount of plant life um, blocks the bottom layer of the ocean where all the plants are and the corals are on the bottom layer from getting sunlight, which then causes those plants to die. When those plants die, they decompose and the decomposition process actually removes oxygen from, from, um, from an environment. Um, so it removes oxygen from the, from the water, from the ocean, that then kills the fish um, and the fish die. Um, so that's, 
basically eutrophication is a lot more and a lot, a lot, a lot more technical things about it, but that it, it's an, it can be naturally occurring, but it's been spiked because of the, uh, how much um, fertilizer has been dumped into the ocean um, in recent years, these algal blooms and this eutrophication, um, which then causes red tide, um, which I don't know if you've ever seen red tide, but it's a pretty nasty event where fish basically wash up on the banks or on the ocean, I mean, on the beach and uh, are dead, infected. And there's all this like um, uh, stuff in the air that makes it hard to breathe. And it's just not fun for anybody. And it kills a lot of fish every year. Mm. Um, it's not good for the environment in general, but eutrophication is naturally occurring on a say that but also it's been happening a crazy amount recently um yeah, if you want a more detailed explanation i would definitely look it up <laughs> i'm yeah i'm not too well versed on it so so you were stating in the beginning that the roa is a is a a great way to like eliminate those kind of pesticides that are creating this in our oceans to start with yeah yeah uh, and another thing that I wanted to touch on is like organic agriculture, you're still allowed to use like 130 or so approved um, fertilizers and chemicals um, and still be considered um, uh, registered organic um, from FDA, from USDA. Um, ROA, you can't use anything, nothing whatsoever. Um, so, so yeah. And, and can you tell us like how widespread I, ROA is becoming? Like, is it becoming more, more urgent or more people um, doing this type of, of agriculture? I definitely say that a lot, of, a lot more people are, are aligning with it. Um, unfortunately, uh, it is just a word um, that isn't copywritten or is not a specific, you know, uh, laid out practice for ROA. Um, so the uh, the other a couple months ago, Monsanto actually used the word regenerative and what they're doing. Um, so it kind of takes away uh, from that. Um, so yeah, it's becoming it's becoming more known, but I think it's more of just like the philosophy behind it. It's the important part and just like the communion and connection with the earth that's most important and growing with nature is the most important part. Um, because I mean organic and regenerative and all these these all these things are kind of just like words that can be stigmatized and used in the wrong ways. So I think that it's it's more important just to know, just to have the knowledge and just do it, you know, um, which would be more effective. Um, but with Roto, Roto Institute has begun becoming a lot more popular um, in recent times, which is really good. Um, I've been following them for a while. Um, but they, because like a lot of the conventional agriculturists are kind of stuck in this situation where like if they don't, if they like literally don't put fertilizer in their soil, the plants won't grow because their soil is so depleted. So like they, they can't not do it. For a season, they'll, they won't have, they won't be able to feed their families or something like that. Um, so that's what what Rodale does is kind of helps farms like that be able to take time and off season to regenerate their soil and not actually produce a yield. So it gives them like compensation to actually to do that, which a lot of these conventional farmers are have been doing it for so long they're stuck um, in this situation. Um, so. That's why I support them a lot. Yeah, makes sense. We we uh, are aligned for sure. Mm -hmm. um, cool. All right, round robin. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll jump in. My next question actually is related to that. Um, but first, your presentation reminded me of how mechanistic the whole conventional farming system is. And it, it seems to even view the human body is a machine that just runs on energy with the, the conventional farming emphasis on uh, calories per acre, you know, just mm -hmm. energy. Whereas the mm -hmm. uh, thing I love about ROA, as you mentioned, it's more concerned with nutrition than just the, 
you know, quant quantity of calories that can yeah. be produced. Um, <clears throat> so one thing you mentioned that interested me is um, you talked about how conventional forms can be converted to practice ROA. And um, I'm wondering what kind of conditions do you see as being most important to encourage conventional farming to shift? Because they're obviously so incentivized right now to grow those three major crops, so. Yeah, yeah, I, I think sadly, one of the biggest things is money um, that you have to use as a, as a, as a leeway. Um, a lot of people believe that organic or ROA will cannot produce uh, with the same yields that conventional can or produce the same amount of money. Um, but it's actually proved, proven that ROA can produce way more um, than conventional agriculturalists can and the same amount of land, same, more of corn. They, they test it with corn because they're like, can you grow this much corn? And they're like, yeah, we can grow even more corn than you. Um, so even with corn, but beyond corn, um, <laughs> uh, can produce way more. And also, I don't know if you noticed, but organic food is usually priced higher, meaning you can get more money for it. Um, so that, that's, a, that's another aspect that you can kind of give to bring them over. Um, and then uh, I, I've, I've sensed and people have told me that there's like this, there's a, a big generational shift happening right now in conventional farming, where like a lot of these really old time farmers are, are getting to the end of their lives. And there's, and there's not a lot of farmers. There's even less farmers now. And as soon there's gonna be even less farmers. So, so there is more of an opportunity for everyone to just become stewards again um, and to start farming, which is another thing. But also it's the scientific research like Rodale has backed science that they've been doing for years and years since the seventies to show farmers, look, here's actual scientific proof that this actually works. So you don't have to be skeptical about it. And here's an example, come to our farm, take a look at it, you can see. Um, though all of those things combined, I think are, are helping the shift. Um, and then also us, being a uh, touched on being a good consumer can help us with the shift. Um, I always think that it's good. I mean, demand is demand. It's, it's crazy what demand can do to, to anything. You, if you can control the demand, it's, um, and you control the demand in, in, in ways. Um, so being voting with your dollar or being a good consumer, um, buying, locally going to farms, buying CSA shares, um, will also kind of organically make that shift as well. Yeah, thank you for that. I think that's a really important topic and that, that's a yeah, pretty clear answer. And I, I like also how you did mention that it's up to us to, um, yeah, it's like our, our dollars are our votes and, um, mm -hmm like, uh, yeah, not purchasing strawberries year round, for instance, like you mentioned, so. Yeah, and it's something that we haven't really, con I, I didn't really think about for a while. And I don't think a lot of people really think about that. They kind of just go to the store and like, hey, I want strawberries today. I'm gonna get strawberries. Or you can be like, is our strawberries in season right now? Where are these strawberries from? These strawberries are from Oregon when I live in Texas. They traveled what twelve hundred or so miles to get here, um, so there's there's all of that to consider as well. Yeah. Okay, I'll pass it to uh, Thailand. <laughs> all right. Um, no, I'm curious if you could kind of walk us through like tell us a little bit more about your story like how you got into all this sort of i'm really curious yeah about just how how you found your way into all this stuff yeah for sure um i touched a little bit on the story in thailand uh with, with starting that plot um 
but I want to say that a lot of it occurred throughout my life, um, just with food in general. Um, food is, is really important. And I was privileged enough to be in a household where I had meals with my family every night. And my dad uh, is a chef. He cooked this really good food. And I was exposed to a lot of different foods and really healthy foods and had a full meal. And uh, I, I would go to other people's houses, other my friends, or I'd go to school and I'd see that a kid didn't have he didn't have his lunch packed or he didn't have a sandwich or things like that. Or I would go to someone's house and they didn't have like a full meal. They were just getting like processed foods and things like that was also kind of opened my mind up to the idea of, of the importance of food in our health and our life and families and our connection with everybody. And when I was in, um, when I came back from Thailand, I started my undergrad in marine biology and I, um, I was looking for a, a CSA, um, which stands for Community Supported Agriculture. It's like a, you can search that online wherever you are and you can find them close to you. It's usually farms that have boxes, share boxes of their produce. Um, usually you can go to their farm and get, pick up the produce um, or you can, they'll have little stations where they'll drop it off for you. I highly recommend everyone, if they aren't already doing that or buying locally, to look up CSAs in their area and, and, and do that. Um, so I was looking for one in my area and I found one that was that was uh, close to me, um, inner city. And I, w I started going there. And uh, the first day I went there, I was like, wow, this place is, is, is amazing. Um, do you need volunteers? And they're like, yeah, we always need volunteers. So I started volunteering for them. And I noticed that I was the only volunteer. <laughs> um, and I was the only one that would, get, would consistently come. And then eventually they offered me a job um, and I accepted the job. Um, and uh, so I've been growing, that's, a, that's at the Fruitful Field in Pompano Beach. Um, it's an awesome place. And uh, recently uh, got offered the management position there. Um, and another, like for me spiritually, um, growing food and giving someone food that I've grown is like the closest that I've ever been to God in my life. Like handing someone food um, and having them eat food that you grow is like so, it's, it's hard to describe, it's ineffable of the impact it can have on your life. Um, here at the Baba Neem Kroli Ashram, we feed people, we're feeding people right now. Um, and just feeding people, I think, is, is awesome. But also feeding yourself um, is very beautiful. Growing the food, having a little seed, it's a little baby, growing it, cultivating it, putting your energy and love into it. Um, all of those things um, have impacted me on my journey. It brought me to where I've been. Um, I know that I've always, uh, I, this has always been inside me. And I believe that we're all stewards of the land in some capacity. And we're all farmers in some capacity. Um, it's just inside of us. Um, we're all connected to the earth. Um, so yeah, I've just been cultivating that uh, throughout my life. And after I, my undergrad, I decided to, to continue my education and get my master's uh, of science in ROA, what I'm currently doing, um, and just developing, growing more, and trying to feed as many people as I can. Thank you. You said you're getting a master's in ROA? Mm -hmm. Where is that program? It's Maharishi International University. Cool. Uh, it's at, I'm actually the, the, I'm the first class uh, doing this master's uh, right. program in the world. <laughs> yeah. It's an uh, online program, correct? Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, they do require you to be working on a farm uh, while you do it, which makes sense. Mm -hmm. That's cool. So you're kind of, everyone's applying the curriculum to wherever they are, to the land that they're yeah. on. That's exactly. Cool. We learn from like other people too. That's yeah. awesome. And I'm, I'm fortunate because I've, I've, since I've been growing here, I mean, I'm in Taos now uh in august i'll be back in florida but i've learned so much growing in this climate i mean 
so much. That's a completely different ball game to what I'm used to, uh, which has expanded my horizon on growing as well. And it made me appreciate what I have uh, in a more Southern climate. Um, but also, you know, there's beautiful things here too. Um, they're great. You can, you can grow in both. There's not really a good or a bad or, you know, they're just different. Thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. All right, Lumi, your turn. Well, I feel so, so soft and tender from your, your uh, expression there, Noah. I love it. Your connection to the plant people and, and to mystery is, is beautiful. And it's a connection that, uh, that we were, we were all meant to uh, experience as we evolved on this planet. And um, I'm going to combine a question. So this is, I'm, I've been looking uh, and paying attention to the, the warming of the planet, warming from the poles. And um, since you have been very connected to the earth and you worked in Thailand and uh, have your farms in Florida. And now you're learning all about the climate in Taos, which is polar opposite. Um, do you have a suggestion for an earth space either here on Turtle Island or anywhere around the world where it would be best to, to um, manifest the physicality of the circular community um, to be able to produce enough food for at least 200 people, the circular community actually, in the end, if there is ever an end, um, is supposed to be multi multi communities, all connected in a Fibonacci pattern. Um, do you have a suggestion of like where where this first one would would be? ideal i guess in the in the mm. changing situations that are happening uh mm. constantly uh we don't yeah. know if the planet's going to warm up to the point where there's not going to be really great places to to rehabilitate yeah that's a really good question and i've you know i've thought about this a lot <laughs> this is kind of something that's always in my mind in some aspect um because I mean, South Florida uh, right now um, uh, gets affected by climate change pretty harshly uh, via hurricanes and high heat and storms and things like that. Um, uh, but I, 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 my personal perspective on, on that is I want to grow uh, in a place that is specifically um, like that um in in, a, in a, a kind of a danger zone i guess you could say um to help the people that are there um get get the food that they need um but for a community like yours um there's a couple things to consider uh i i if it was me and i was picking a place i would not pick a place that has um too harsh of a winter um i would look at like average snowfall um, I would, I wouldn't be, uh, I probably wouldn't be above 5,000 feet in altitude. Um, I would probably be somewhere where, where climate is, has been pretty consistent in the last 50 to a hundred years, um, on average. Um, I really like, uh, the, like Appalachian mountain region, um, Blue Ridge Parkway. Um, it just, uh, it seems like a very fertile land. I mean, it's fertile, um, because of the, uh, geography and what the movement of the earth and what happened there. Um, it get, gets good rainfall. It's not too harsh of a winter. The growing season's relatively long, uh, compared to other places. Um, um, it's, it's pretty open. Also, um, I mean, I also like Costa Rica <laughs> uh, as well. Um, that's, you know, tropical, um, 
because it's so easy to grow food there literally it's like you don't have to do anything and you have everything you need um and it's crazy beautiful and there's a lot of really cool communities in costa rica as well um that are i've, I've already been doing something similar to your ideas um, um so but also you could look outside of the u.s as well um i haven't really i haven't, haven't traveled the majority of the world um uh and, and known but i guess for getting people somewhere i don't know how how easy that'd be and there's and laws and things like that um but yeah i think i would pick a place that has like most consistent seasons not too cold not too crazy of snowfall um if there is snow um things like that okay thank you mm -hmm. Uh, and I one of the things I, I sorry, I've been hear, hearing uh, about reports in Pennsylvania because Pennsylvania used to have a lot of snowfall, and um, right now they're having less and less and less snow, um, more heat throughout the year. And um, I, I spent 33 years in Pennsylvania, and so it's kind of interesting in that there's a lot of uh, rich soil there. I'm also concerned in this country about the fracking wells. I worked with the Delaware River Keepers for a long time on anti-fracturing uh, lobbying and things like that and um, trying to get them to stop that. But this country has more fracking wells than any other, any other earth space anywhere. And uh, it, it affects the underground tributaries, which affect the soil and everything. Um, so it's, it's, it's something that I'm looking deeply into um, as we dance this awake, uh, not physically awake, but all of the other aspects, the psycho-spiritual aspects, the learning, and we're all experimenting with, with mushrooms and, and saving seeds and growing the seeds that we saved and working with the earth spaces that we're currently living on. And, um, you know, I, I think that when the time does come to build that we'll know where that is because causes and conditions will, will determine that. And mm -hmm. uh, the world is changing at phenomenal rates, uh, socially and, um, and physically. So, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I also think that, um, like, you can pick a really good location or you could or and it'd be really good um, but also i feel like you could make anything of any any location if you have to with with roa i mean i mean i don't know if i mentioned this in my in the presentation if i didn't i meant to but um with roa if everyone if all the farms in the world right now that are away um, and converted, it would it would end climate change, reverse it in seven years. Um, so it's not like an unfathomable um, thing. And I tell that to people and they're like, no, that's not true. But um, literally, you, you, you would be sequestering 100% um, of the CO2 that we emit every year. Um, and it's very, very simply done. Um, uh, like unfortunately, I've I've like uh, through through growing, I've uh, carbon offset myself for life um, with with what I've been growing. But if everyone you know did it, they, they would carbon offset themselves as well, and we could carbon offset you know the whole world and everything we do. Um, so and like I've heard also people say that like New Mexico could be a really interesting opportunity for like, if you're thinking about like how climate change works, um, because they say that like, it's it's like, as climate change goes on, New Mexico will start to form into like a more hospitable place than it is now, because it like the, I, I don't really know the exact theory, but it's like, it won't be as cold and it won't be as hot or something because it'll like, I don't know. 
but they said people say people i've heard people say that like new mexico or like desert high desert regions could also be good with how how like the climactic changes could work like if you're looking at like 200 years in the future yeah the, the ph of the soil has to change drastically for sure but yeah. um yeah I, I know that with vermiculture you can do that the biggest little farm did some similar things in that documentary those folks yeah and, uh, proved that that could happen you can take the worst piece of land and and really rehabilitate it and create biodiversity that's really beautiful mm -hmm. So, so we're at 8,440 feet <laughs> and it snows and it's cold and the season is really, really short. So this year we've decided in the, um, uh, what I call the fort, it's, it's our, our um, container gardens on the ground. Um, we've decided to plant potatoes and beets and root vegetables. If you were, and we don't do it in the ground because we have too many species that, that are burrowing species that eat everything under the ground. So, um, so they're on these raised beds. If, if I were to, my, my question is when you go to harvest root vegetables, you are disturbing the soil to do that. Do you have a methodology or an idea for restoring that soil right after? Um, is the mycelium enough to do that or adding compost at, right after you you take those those uh, root vegetables out? Yeah, that's a really, really good, really good question. Um, and uh, it's one of the reasons I don't grow a lot of vegetables is is part of, partly because of that reason, um, is is disturbance. But um, also, it's not like uh, root disturbance doesn't occur in nature. Um, you just got to treat it exactly what nature will do. And there's a root disturbance. Just add organic matter, just add compost, um, and let it heal. Um, in that way, is 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 the best. Um, because you know animals will burrow and they'll dig and they'll take plants out of the ground and they'll do things like that. So if you just imagine that you're doing that, um, you know, just add some poop, like poop on the ground, just like an animal would, or um, add compost and things like that, is what I would say the best thing to do. But that's uh, it's really good. I think that you're that you're thinking like that. <laughs> that's like a really really good question, honestly. Well, it's interesting because like being a macrobiotic practitioner, um, you know, the root vegetables will keep you warm in winter. Yeah. And that's what grows in the mountains best. That yeah. and onions and garlic and, um, you know, certain flowers like the, the uh, nasturtium do really well. And we've had to grow our tomatoes indoors because we have some passive solar happening in this dodecagon but uh so we grow them indoors we put them outside they got a little shock this year <laughs> but all of their lower leaves are starting to come back and we'll bring them back in when the frost starts coming back but um you know i've done a lot a lot of foraging my grandmother in the mountains um grew a garden and she canned and she dried meat and she canned and she did have apiaries um she basically went to town to um, trade her eggs and worms for the fishermen and um to get toilet paper she was that self-sufficient mm. in in how she lived with the land and mm. um so I'm, I'm concerned about the carbon and releasing the carbon and, and lowering my carbon footstep and, um, you know, figuring out a way to work with mushrooms and mycelium to, to do that. Uh, we've only just begun with the mycelium. We have inoculated logs and we tried some on straw, but um, here it's like mostly rock in the Rocky Mountains. So, you know, 
in this vision, seeing that there will be circular communities on the planet, on the entire planet eventually, um, unless we self-destruct, um, we need to learn how to grow what's going to be in most balance with our bodies and with the earth. Yeah. And um, so I was just curious about like, what do you do about that? We have container gardens up here. We can grow lettuces through until it freezes. Um, and not even allowed to, mm -hmm. we're renting, so we're not even allowed to build a greenhouse. So um, I think greenhouses would work pretty well. I know earthships have worked well, way above, um, you know, at high, high altitude, eight, 10, 11,000 feet. But um, it isn't sufficient for nutrition. Um, and it's not even macrobiotic to be eating bananas out of an earthship in a in a cold climate at high altitude because they don't grow naturally there i really resonated with your let's eat what's in season yeah. we need to be eating what's in season so that we can acclimate to the climate and um yes yeah so uh whew. i'll pass it, i'll pass it to jason for for now i have some more <laughs> Thank you for your answer. May your life go well. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I have kind of a quicker question and maybe one also that's um, slightly more involved, but I'll ask the quicker one first, which is we're all kind of microfiles here and um, interested in, in using mycelium and cultivating it. And I haven't heard the term fungal dominated soil before until your presentation. So the kind of more technical, quicker question is, how do you realize when your soil has kind of reached that fungal dominated status? I mean, obviously if it's growing mushrooms, that's a good sign. That's a, that's a really good question. And um, yeah, that, that term is, is, is a new term uh, in agriculture. Um, because we didn't really understand how important uh, fungal networks are to soil. Um, we thought that like a proper ratio of bacteria uh, to, to fungus um, was more bacteria high. Um, but now we're learning that you actually want it to be the, the fungus to be the higher of the ratio. Um, a couple of things. One, uh, of course, is seeing mushrooms grow. Um, two is literally seeing mycelium in the soil. Um, which that's what I see in my soil. You could pick up my soil and see little networks of mycelium in my soil. So seeing physical mycelium, you're like, okay, I know there's mycelium in there. Um, two is the, or three is the smell. Like I said, sweet, sweet smelling soil is a really good sign. Um, and not just, and not just like, like actual, like sugar, sweet, sweet, um, is a really good sign. Um, and also you could get a, uh, you could do a soil test. Um, the university of Florida does free soil tests that you can send it that you could get. So they'll tell you the, the ratio. Okay. But also, uh, I, I wanted to mention that, um, I forgot to mention that the, those buckets I was growing inside when I was talking about indoor versus outdoor mushroom, the, the cocoa core, after I, those fruited like three or four times and I harvested all those pink oyster mushrooms off of it. What I have in that bucket now is like basically mushroom compost in a way that's just full of mycelium. So I just take that bucket and either put it on my soil as an amendment or dump it into my compost. Um, so you're not, you're adding fungus that way as well. <laughs> 